What is, what is high level is to understand that they want to keep you on a low level, mm -hmm. right? And the reason why 19 Keys is pushing high level is for us to begin to look at even the question of knowledge. Even the question of knowledge. Because you got to really love your people to do this work. We want a generation of real solution. We want real change. We were calling for safety and economic empowerment. When you put a whole generation in jail, yeah. or you kill a whole generation, yeah. that has an impact on what the next generation is going to do. This is a societal systemic issue. So it's a white culture in America that is inherently racist. And this is specifically for black men because of systematic issues that they face in America. I appreciate my pops for teaching me how to be a guy. From a boy to a man and ultimately back into the natural state of being into a guy. See, as guys, we're supposed to always move with that higher self. And I have to be able to execute it. Having knowledge is not power, the execution of knowledge is power. Knowledge makes a man unfit to be a slave. Because the only real knowledge you can get is knowledge of self. Peace family, it's 19 Keys. Welcome back to another high level conversation. Today, we have a very important conversation that I think that everybody who's sitting at home um, and everybody who's listening, this impacts in some way or another. Whether you have a relative that is locked in jail or whether you have a run in with the police or whether you have a issue with the way society is going, the lack of moral constitution that we have in the world, the issues when it comes to conflict resolution, um, the problems when it comes to, you know, seeing a revolution with the type of results that I believe that we believe that we should have gotten 50 years ago, but we have to continue to fight on and on every single day because every single day there's another problem because the problem is systematic. The problem is not even just local, the problem is global when you go around the world and you see that the people at the bottom are struggling because the people at the top want to live comfortably, right? And the people at the top have the privilege to ignore what's happening at the bottom because they don't have to live in the same dirt as everybody else. And so the people who get their hands dirty, the people who are in the midst of fighting the good fight, the people who are the real revolutionaries are often unseen. My issue a lot of times when it comes to the idea of revolution is the fact that a lot of times the people put the revolution on the revolutionaries. And for me, the people have to be the revolution. The, like everybody has to be a leader, right? Because a leader may come up with the idea, say, hey, let's go. But that first line of people that say, I'm ready, those are the most revolutionary people. And then those people who tell somebody else, that's the second line of leaders and the third line of leaders. So for me, there are no true followers, right? It's just different degrees of leadership. Some people may be first, the other person may give them word of mouth, and the other person may tug on, and then when they see so many other people being led in the right direction, then they lead themselves in that direction as well, as an example, and show somebody else what to do and how it can be done. Now, in this work, there's the work that looks sexy, and then there's the work that's ugly. Oftentimes, the ugly work is not shown. In a world of digital activism and digital revolution on social media, it's easy to clip up things and to create, you know, noise. But then from which that noise came from, the people who are actually in the clips, the people who are actually doing the work on the streets, and they're not looking for, you know, to be seen. They're looking to make impact, right? And these are the type of people that I'm having a conversation with today, the people that are looking to make impact. Me as, I would say, in this new age of 
revolution or leadership or whatever title or word you want to put on it. For me, I just believe I grew up with a consciousness and I was always taught to fight for my people because these are my people. So anything that I can do and any skill set, any resource that I do have, I'm going to utilize it in that capacity to do the good that I believe is working. Right. But there are so many different fronts and there's different soldiers in different parts of the world or different parts of the war, rather. And so each part is imperative in order for us to win. It's not just the, the soldier that's in front. It's not just the general that's giving the plans. It might be the drummer that's helping with morale. It might be the politician who's also going along with the agenda. Right. It may be a person that's getting the resources and the supplies. It may be the person that's spreading the word. Right. It may be the person doing the ministry to make sure that the spiritual uh, morale of the soldiers stay in place. It may be the person making the uniforms. Each part of a person and each part of participation in the war is just as valuable as the next. Right. But history is selfish. We always remember the person up front. <laughs> History is selfish. We usually put one person in front and the team doesn't usually get credit. But that's OK, because as long as the impact is made, that's what's necessary. Right. The celebration is not the celebrity. The celebration is the impact and the results. So today I'm joined with people that I respect. My good brother, Jay Jordan, who has been on the side of the law from getting locked up to helping people that have been incarcerated and freeing them and also getting bills passed on the legislative side and working with corporations to get funding for, you know, things that will impact the system, even though that's you know, it's kind of like trying to clean the ocean of this poison using a net. Right. The more work you do, you realize how much bigger the problem is. And so the fight starts to change in your mind because the perspective starts to change on what's necessary in order to win this fight. And so you start thinking bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. The soldier only sees the battle in front of him. The general has to see the whole field. So he has to plan completely different and the soldier don't have to understand what the general knows. So every great soldier, if they live long enough, end up turning into a general based on their experience and understanding what's necessary in order to win the fight. Today, the general Erica Ford has been in the fight for over 50 years. She is one of the most well-known people in this fight whether it's conflict resolution, directly dealing in the streets, whether it's dealing with the entertainment community and the industry to stop conflicts, whether it's helping get bills passed. Every time I see her spirit, I get invigorated, I get joyful. And at the same time, you just realize that when there's somebody older than you doing more work than you, it makes you want to work harder, right? Especially the, the, the type of work that she does when it comes to putting her body, her spirit, her mind, her health, right, all her time, energy, and resources into helping our people. So it means that you can't get lazy as well on that front. It means that you can't get lazy on this battle. And she's always been a helping hand. She's always tried to relay resources my way, anything that she could do. And I know that my generation of work is different than hers and she embraces it fully. And so I embrace that connection. And that's why I wanted to have her on the show and the good brother Jay Jordan because of all of the work that they are doing. So we can start bridging the gap between what's necessary and therefore we can start winning more of these battles. So I appreciate y'all being here with me. Welcome to High Level Conversations. I wanna get into your story a little bit. I don't get into every guest story just because I feel like there's enough out there when people do interviews, but your story is history, right? Because it tells the story of the culture, right? It tells the story of the streets of New York. It tells the story of activism in America, right? So I want to understand how did you get passionate, endlessly passionate, to where it lasted this long? Like, what was that moment that is like, it started and it never stopped for you? Day one. You know, day one uh, was December 12, 1987. There was a parent whose sons were in the local jail. There was men dressed up in KKK suits, and they were hosing down the men and turning up the air condition. And so she galvanized Sonny Carson, Viola Plummer, and other folks to do a rally up in Goshen County. At the same time, Tawana Brawley had got raped. And so... Folks came from all over the United States. And Farrakhan was there. Jesse Jackson was there. It's actually the first time Farrakhan ever marched in a rally. Um, and just listening. And it was my first time being at a... December 12, 1987. 
And so um, I attended that rally. And the funny thing is I was at my friend's house going to a party, right? Because, you know, we were hanging with the cats in the streets, Spree Team, all of the different cats, farmers. And I saw the flyer and I was like, yo, I want to go to that. What is that? But it, the day of, I was like, yo, uh, I went to the party the night before. So I was tired. I was like, I ain't going to no rally. It's like, you don't tell my aunt. You know, you going and you ain't going because, you know, now I know because I know Viola Plummer, what she meant. Like, that's your aunt. I don't care. <laughs> right? And I was going to actually go take the test to be a crooked cop. Mm -hmm. Right? That was my full intention because I was like, I could take the test. I could be a crooked cop and I could let the drug dealers know. But I luckily didn't do that because I'd be dead or in jail right now. <laughs> and I went to that rally and just sitting there listening, I realized that there was something more to the world than just trying to be fly and hanging out at the hottest party. And, and it really, you know, like people go to church and get woke or wake. Um, I was saved. See, I don't even, um, I got woke. I got conscious. And I, I never looked back. I never looked back. Um, the next day, I, I went to Floyd Flake's church, who was a local cathedral, and, like, did a rally in the middle of his church went to different people's houses and like, and it's just been working for the people ever since, you know. So. And when you're committed to the people, yeah. like I'm not looking for a return. I'm not looking for somebody to pay me. I wasn't looking, like I wasn't, that wasn't my job. That was my life. I dedicated my life to doing that. And so when you're in it from that perspective, the reward is the people, right? And so, because you got to really love your people to do this work. Yeah, but I mean, even that, it, it sounds like you're starting off as a sacrifice. You're in it for the people, right? But then you still have to maintain a certain quality of life, right? So how do you feed yourself and then at the same time dedicate your life, right, to a cause that has no profit in it? Right. So in the first phases, I, I never even thought of that, right? You know, one of the lessons that was taught to me is that you know, if you really know how to do this work, you'll never be hungry, you'll never be homeless, and you'll never be without clothes. And it, it by divine spirit, right, whenever it was, I was running into the wall, it could, it, something would pop up. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, people would open up their houses, or, and not that I was homeless, but if I'm going someplace, you know, and, and my mother helped take care of, supported the cause. She supported me, so... You know, and, and it was the rest. It, it's a hard process in terms of being selfless, mm -hmm. right? Because, and then I guess because there was no social media, you're not really looking at what everybody else is doing, mm -hmm. right? So I was content with who I was right. and what I'm doing, right? I'm not looking at everybody else. I'm not comparing myself to so many different peoples and having to make a post about, I put up a flyer, you know, um, so it was less stress on you and, and you're able to be just focused on the work and not really looking at it. But as I get older and, and talking about where am I going after this, I'm not trying to die a broke revolutionary, you know, or somebody that like I, I don't want to be that person. And I think that it's important for us to know that we have a right to have quality life. We have a right to have anything that we want. You know, we have a right to do that, and so I work towards that lane right now. First of all, that was a dope story you just told. You said you and Farrakhan marched in the first march. <laughs> you was at the party with Supreme Team and them. Then you was about to become a cricket cop, and instead, this is a quick movie. <laughs> that was, I didn't want to breeze past that. For those who don't know, like, so you, you, I want to dig into just a little more. So you, you just set the scene in the 80s, so... Everybody will know who Supreme Team is, right? To understand, like, okay, going from that side of the tracks to this one is a is a pretty big leap, right? So how were you involved in that back in the day, like, as far as an influence on you? Because it had, couldn't it, I mean, just for the idea of you saying that, yo, I want to help them by joining, you know, the police force and then utilizing your position to make sure that they're able to continue to do what they do it means you was kind of involved in it. So, like... You know, if, if you can, just a glossary. Who was the Supreme Team? What they mean to New York? Supreme Team is, was a, a, a drug dealer, a kingpin, 
in New York City uh, defined by the system. Um, and he ran an area called Baisley Houses. And then there was another one, Fat Cat, who controlled 150th South Road. And there was another one on Farmers Ronnie Bump who controlled Farmers Boulevard. And then we had Coley Wall in 40 Projects. So these are larger-than-life individuals, Tommy Montana. And so I was one of those people who hung in every section. Like, I didn't just pick a section. I hung with all of them, me and my friends. And so as we grew through that process, I saw what was happening to their partners and to their children when they were killed, when people went to jail for 30, 40 years. You know, I saw the, 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 the life go out of their children. And so these individuals who were looked at as royalty, like, because before hip-hop, they were the stars, mm -hmm. right? And they were the ones with the hot cars. They were the one with the girls in terms of the guys trying to be like them and all the girls wanting to date them and, you know, just being a continual cycle of you got to be where something's going on. And, and for us, um, we had the privilege of having parties all the time. Like, we had block parties. We had um, park parties. We had the big shows. We had skating parties. It was a lot to do as young people. And you, it was always big because you had five big crews who was bringing out their whole crew. And so everybody wanted to be part of that. You know, like, you're a child. You see that. Like, and you want to have fun. And so everybody was engaged in the fun in Southeast Queens. And, and it's a small knit community. And so we worked, you know, we hung out or, or my friends dated different ones of them. But also then they started to help me in the work that I'm doing. Like, you know, um, they supported me with making it cool, with making sure that we had a code to the street. We worked with Tupac Shakur and Matulu Shakur, rest they both souls, um, and put together the code to the streets and worked with the brothers inside the wall, behind the wall, to write the code to the streets, right? And then... So what's the code to the streets? No snitching, no shooting at par. It's, it's 26 different codes, right? The ones that people focused on the most was no snitching, yeah. <laughs> right? <laughs> now it's the one people ignore the most. <laughs> that part, <laughs> you know, and, and also what is snitching, right? And, and we lose sight of what really is snitching because um, snitching is if me and you are doing something right. and I go tell on you mm -hmm. to reduce the time that I'm getting mm -hmm. um, for myself. And so not if I'm a citizen and I'm just at home and I see something happening, I'm not a snitch because I want safety for myself and my family, right? Or if I'm a black woman and I'm getting beat by my husband, then I, I'm not involved in unless I was an aggressor yesterday, you know, like, but um, we got to find ways. And so that also flipped into the work that we do, right? Because we didn't want people to have to call the police, right? We wanted you to call, call the community, right? How can we resolve it? And so that's how we... Um, so I'm going to get back into the Tupac in a little later. But for now, I want to I wanna harp a little bit on the, on the snitching thing because I, I feel like, number one, we are more upset about a black man snitching on another black man versus a black man killing another black man today, right? And so at this point, the code or the idea of the code is it has been twisted, right? And it's more detrimental, right? Because people only uphold it when it fits their agenda, right? And at the same time, most people are not following the rest of the code, right? So you kind of just picking pieces of it. And this generation don't come from that same moral constitution of the streets that came up with the code. So for them, it's outdated. For them, it has to be updated so it can fit the new nuances and the new context and the way that the world is being ran today, the way that the streets is today. Because one has to say like, okay, you know, I was always taught that superior knowledge never submits to inferior knowledge, and all knowledge expires when there's superior knowledge that comes along, whether it's like a new scientific paradigm, but now we're in a new street paradigm. So one can say that, okay, that code was created, but it has to expire, and now a new one has to be written, and everybody can agree on that, so that becomes the standard that people follow, so now you can hold people to a standard, because you can't hold people to a code that they were never a part of, Right? So it's not like the Constitution, you know what I mean? Like there's an actual like an army that says either you follow the laws or you go to jail, right? So that code is not enforced. It used to be enforced by the streets, but now nobody's following the code, 
right? And the moment that it fits somebody that you like or you don't like when one person breaks an aspect of it, now you want to uphold it high. But there's no morals in the streets, right? And I, I, I want to hear, you know, either one of your conversation about this because, you know, especially with where hip hop is today in the grand scale and both of you all work closely with hip hop figures, rappers, things of that nature to help do the work that you do. Do you believe that, you know, there is a code and, and, and if there is one or if there isn't one, what should be the norm? The, the whole question of the code, right? When you put a whole generation in jail yeah. or you kill a whole generation, yeah. that has an impact on what the next generation is going to do. Uh -huh. Because that level of knowledge is not being passed on, like you said. Mm -hmm. That level of order and discipline is not being passed on, like you said. That's intentional, right? And so that leads to what you're talking about and how they intentionally put the drugs and the guns in to bring the, capture these people, create further disruption, and then set the laws to inf in, in, incarcerate and destroy, right? And so, so you're absolutely right, but who, then there was a council of OGs yeah. that would hold people accountable like the army, right? Because we, just like when you go to other communities, they have a council. Right. You do something, you go into That's the council, right? right? And so we need OGs to come back to the table, right? And really not, because now OGs are on IG, yeah. right? And so you can't, to me, like, you can't be an OG shining on o IG. Yeah, no, you right? can't compete with because, your constituents. Right, because these kids are not going to respect you, right? And so we have to have a, a, a regroup um, around how we put order back in our street, because these are our children. However we want to look at it, they're our children, right? And so... so yeah, I, yeah, I got... So when we say the streets, right? Like, for me, when I think of an OG, I don't think of somebody selling dope. I don't think of somebody with their pants hanging off their ass, talking about cuz this, blood, that. I don't think of my OG. My OG on properties, my OG is, is, is on his own business. He's the CEO of his own household. You know what I mean? He got his money right. He's taking care of his family. He's taking care of his kids. He's participating in new sports. Like, he's structured. He's a man. You know? He's a, she, for me, my OG, because I'm a man, is a man. Right? When I think of OG's women, like, like you, an OG. That is an OG. You ain't in the streets. You go to the streets to ensure that the folks who are in the streets understand what it is, but you try to pull them out the streets. So like getting out this mind frame and elevating the, the, the conversation of what the code in the streets, man, the streets is toxic. Yeah. It should like, the streets has no code. You know, it, it's the wild, wild west. Like, so like, and, 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 and like, and the streets weren't made for us. Well, actually, let me take that back. They were made for us. The conditions in those streets were made for us to live in that cesspool, but it wasn't who we are. We're not made to be in the streets. That stuff is, is, is not natural to us. That's why we're running around, you know, doing primitive things, thinking primitive ways, because it's made for us to do that. When you extract people from the streets, they begin to think differently. They become OGs. You ain't elevated my mind to an OG until you get out the streets. You know, I don't, I, I went to prison not because I was smart and all the gangsta, I went to prison because I was dumb. I got caught, you know? Folks in prison, anybody will tell you, you know, any cat in prison right now will tell you, man, this ain't cool. Right. This ain't cool. Right. You know, to have to go to prison, get locked up, and for everyone that don't know about what happens in prison when you go, the first thing they do is they strip you down of your clothes, they make you run your finger in your mouth, they make you turn around, spread your butt cheeks, and cough in front of another man, in front of another woman. That's what you got to do. That's cool. You ain't an OG if you go through that, and you make it through that. And you like having to eat, I was talking to the brother earlier, I used to have 200 soups, 200 top ramen every single month. I thought I was the business. All that sodium, you know what I mean? All that salt was ruining my health. But, but they made it, like that was the conditioning. So you go through that, and then you get out, and OGs, like that's not an OG because you went to prison, it was an OG because you elevated the way you're thinking, you elevating the vibrations, and then you're going back to the streets and saying, hey, young, hey, young blood, come back over here, get out the streets. That's an OG. OGs is taking folks out the streets. Ain't no code in the streets. Ain't no code in the streets. You can't have no code in the streets because the conditions in which the streets were, were, um, were made is to not have a code, is to be snitches. Like those streets, 
crack, heroin, guns. That didn't come from us. Like black black folks didn't import heroin. Black folks didn't make crack. <laughs> you know what I mean? That, that, what what chemist? You show me a black chemist that took a whole bunch of powder cocaine and all of a sudden had the idea to you know heat it up, cool it down, heat it up, cool, cool it down, and boom, we got base rock. That didn't come from us. Guns. We weren't they Chinese AKs. We ain't Chinese. Russian AKs. That didn't come from us. Uzi didn't come from us. The streets didn't come from us. They created these conditions in the streets, and then we we live in an access pool, and we're trying to make sense of it, but we can never make sense of it. We always have these conversations. That's why when you talk about hip hop 50, right? Hip hop come from the streets. It's telling the stories of the streets. It don't make sense. It's like, yo, well, if you listen to Tupac's lyrics, he's like, Brenda had a baby. Brenda put the, the baby in a dumpster. It's like, it don't make no sense because it is, it is not healthy. It is, it is evil to be in the streets. And for anybody to say, I'm in the streets and I'm cool and I'm an OG, you are not. You are not an OG if you were leading these young brothers and young sisters down a path of destruction, you know, because the streets don't leave nowhere but prison or, or, or the graveyard. And I've been to prison. That shit ain't cool. And everybody in prison tell you the same thing. Everybody who gets out will tell you the same thing. That's just not cool. So if you're leading young cats and young, young women down a pathway of destruction, in my mind, in my book, in my rule book, you will never be an OG and until you get out the streets and you start pulling people out the streets. Mm. So, you know, what I hear, and, and I was insightful because it, it sparked some thoughts, you know. The streets is always for the dead. You know, people say the streets is dead. The streets has always been a graveyard. The streets is the, what creates the snitches, right? And that's the reason. Otherwise, you wouldn't have to create a code for the streets because the streets, when you grow up in them, you grow up in impoverished environments, low education, usually a busy household, so the family dynamics is lacking. And so now you outside looking for love, you know what I mean? Because you're not getting that inside the house or you come from an environment, you know, that's full of conflict. So this is what you learn. So when you go out there, now you getting involved in different things, not having money. You want money because you see people who have money are inside a criminal element. So you get caught up in situations and now, you know, the way to get out of it is to tell, is to be a law abiding citizen after you break the law. So it creates the opportunity and the, it creates the environment for snitching because it's crime. So snitching comes with crime. Like that's just a fact. You're not going to ever get away from that. It's never, if, if you got this idea that there's ever going to be a perfect world where people commit crimes and then they don't snitch to get themselves out of a situation so that they don't end up in prison for 20, 30, 40 crazy numbers that they throw at these young boys and young girls, then you lost your mind. So it's like the, the fact that you you know, know this now and you're conscious of it and say, I'm still going to be in this element. I'm still going to do this. Yet you want people to uphold a code, you know, that was made at a time where people understood like the streets is toxic. So we got to tell these dudes, even though you go do this, abide by these codes. Because who did that really kept safe? That really kept safe the, the OGs or so-called OGs at that time that was able to pin it on the youngsters. You know what I mean? You take this charge from we go throw this on you. So a lot of times, I mean, since the beginning, it's always been manipulated. It ain't never been no honor amongst these. And I think that we got to go back to what created the whole thing, right? So when you look at the history of our community, the Panthers were on a move and dealing with safety and oppression and racism and trying to feed our community, trying to employ our community, all the things that y'all talk about on a regular basis, they needed to disrupt that, right? It's always how do we disrupt and then you put the drugs and, and the guns in the community, and then people built, well, they allowed them to build an economy off of Because just like you said on an interview before, if they fed them, or both of y'all at different times, if they fed them something else, they would have gave them something else, right? But they do that intentionally because they want to keep us in a way, right? And so when we look at an OG, right, as an original gangster, right, they are... You could have your opinion, but those brothers who are older in this industry, right, are still that. But those are always the target, right? Because, as you said before, you're working with hopefully the most conscious. You want to elevate them, and then those in the middle, you want to elevate them, and then those on the bottom, you want to elevate them, right? And so when you're looking to put a code on the street, it has to come with someone enforcing it, someone holding order. It's not going to be the young person, right? And so you, you always want to 
impact those who both have stopped and coming home and want to help get people out and those on the on the on the fence, right? Yeah. And and hopefully you can get them fully out, right? And sometimes it's having like so we created a business so that we can hire you. And you're a credible messenger. You're an authority in the streets because of the history and the knowledge, work experience, right? And so now you're closest to have the ability to talk to that young person, give him the language that he needs to do something different. And, and, and it has been successful. Mm -hmm. You know, we've built a system in New York City called the New York City Crisis Management System, which we started from talking about the Code Foundation with Tupac and Supreme and Stretch mm -hmm. and other um, brother Chaz from Black Hand Entertainment, right? Um, and those were, those were icons, legends in, in our streets, right? But they saw something different needing to happen. But they were still on the ledge, right? And so um, I'm still here, right? And, and still getting that support from the brothers but, and the sisters. And we're building, but we lost a lot of good souls. You know, we lost a lot. We lost a lot. And we can't talk about Hip Hop 50 without talking about the impact of hip hop on the streets. We can't talk about moving forward without the state of chaos in the streets with, with our young people and drill movies. We can't take shit and try to call, call it chocolate cake. Drill music, I don't, you know, it's, 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 you're talking about somebody who's dead yeah. and you're making fun of it. There's no good that can come out. It doesn't matter, that's no different than, you know, like people you say with the crack dealer, right? Somebody gotta do it, they're making money, you know, if I don't sell it, somebody else gonna, but that's how they want us to think, right? And, and when you, you talk about it all the time, if we look at the power that we have as a community, as individuals, as Hip Hop 50, right, and ever think, because there's a lot of artists out there. There's a lot of artists across America. And I represent the streets. I represent the streets. How much money are you putting in the streets? Because you're giving your money to the Cancer Society, the Boys and Girls Club. You're not giving it to Erica Ford. You're not giving it to those, to, well, you work for them big groups, but. Gathering for justice, yeah. you know, the Justice League and the other brothers and sisters who are on the front line across America who are sacrificing their life to make sure that these brothers and sisters are not going to jail, are not killing each other, are safe in the streets. Your mother's able to get back and forth to work because they still live in the hood, right? So we can't. We have to have a thing where we we're not going out there. When you we we here surrounded by Harry Belafonte, right? And Harry Belafonte supported the movement. Mm -hmm. He supported the movement. He understood his role and responsibility as an artist. If you're going to jump into Crown Society, you're saying that I represent power, I represent knowledge of self. Stepping in the name of drip, get ready with me. Stepping in the name of drip, get ready. I wear the crown to just symbolize, like, I know who I am, I know why I'm here, I know my purpose. It's abundance, it's royalty, it's prosperity, it's energy. It's Put in. Yeah. I gotta walk with my head held high, because you gotta see this and you gotta see this. I believe that if anybody wants to be able to protect their mind and be able to think freely, you gotta get crown society today, man. Blue pill, the color palette's all black. The James Bond mix with Malcolm X and my Che Guevara era. I, I, I like, I know a lot of artists now because I literally stalk them. Mm. You know, I would, it's Super Bowl weekend. I'm gonna go to the most expensive hotel because that's where they at, and I'm gonna be there all day. And as they walk through the lobby, yo, da, da, yo, da, 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 da. and after a couple of years, they see me so much, they think they know me, right? And so then we become colleagues. But it's not because they had the intentionality to support the streets. Mm -hmm. They don't. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes you could be an OG and you're still not an OG. I, I think what, <laughs> what comes up for me ever having this conversation is it, it's it's kind of semantics but I'm gonna play the semantic game a little bit 
So you got the actual like neighborhood. You got neighborhoods. And in those neighborhoods, right, like project, like then you got folks who are outside in the actual streets, right? <laughs> like on the sidewalk, in the playgrounds, doing what they do. Like, so I wanted to separate those two things, right? Because like you got folks in the neighborhood that don't be in the streets, don't be outside and handling their business. And you got folks in the streets that are out there. And I and I truly believe, not get not to get too out there, but there's a spiritual force pulling those people and keeping those people in the streets, right? Keeping those people outside in the streets doing what they do and they can't get away. So I do, I do agree that you gotta have folks that are outside in those streets, right? Helping to, you know, guide those folks the best they can because they in it too and they can't get away. So I, while- This OG told me once, he said that people look at drugs as an addiction, look, you know, a liquor is an addiction, but that whole street culture is an addiction. addiction. I mean, that, not to cut your wisdom, but that, that I mean, that, that's psychological. Like, right? we can be addicted to anything. You can be addicted to conflict, right? You can be addicted to, you know, um, not having peace. If you grow up in an environment and you see your mother and your father always fighting, right? That's what you get used to, right? And because you're used to it, being in environments of conflicts make you feel comfortable. Right. So things outside of that environment don't make you feel comfortable, which is why a lot of people don't want to leave the streets because they may be treacherous, dangerous and toxic. But that's where they're comfortable at. When you take them into an environment where they safe, that's where they feel uncomfortable. They don't want to travel outside that bounds. They don't want to go to some rich place. They don't want to be in these bougie environments, as they call it, because they don't feel comfortable there. They want to go back to what their body craves and what it knows. That's what addiction is. And so it's 100% we're addicted to the trauma of our environments. So for me, that's why, you know, environment, I was always taught stronger than nature. So changing the environment and, and taking people out of that, I think Mr. Farrakhan, speaking to this reporter, and she was asking him how come they didn't let her in the mosque and with the cameras. And he was explaining, he said, when you go to a mental hospital or you go to a hospital, they're not going to let you in around the patients, Right. Number one, the reason they have these patients watered off because they're sick. And when the person is sick, you have to separate them from the environment that makes them sick. Right. And then you have to give put them in, you know, uh, a situation where you can give them the medicine and you can make them better. But that separation has to happen first. So I'm a firm believer that, you know, the number one, you have to expose people to different realities and take them to different environments versus the one that's keeping them who they are, because that familiarity Right, it's gonna have them going back to who they are and what they know. We know this. Our uncles and peoples that are anytime they go back to where they came from, they start doing the exact same thing. Whether it was drinking, whether it was smoking, whether it was doing the drugs in that environment. Why? Because the people in that environment doing the same thing. It's like a time capsule, and now they they're pulling on that self, not the self that's trying to make it better and be more disciplined. What the streets lack is discipline more than anything, right? Like when you take a child through military discipline, they could have been going through 21 years of the streets and you take them to the military, you separate them, have them change their, their identity, change their, uh, uh, their name, right? Change the way that they think, their, their eating, their habits. Now you can change 21 years, right, of bad habits by putting them in an environment of discipline. That's why the military works so well for young men and women. Right. Because it's changing their environment, it's changing their mind, and it's changing who they are. But when you're in the streets, you've got that same spirit of a soldier. But the battlefield is, is trauma every single day. And they got PTSD and they're trying to do coping mechanisms so that they can continue just to survive. And survival makes your scope of thinking very narrow. I ain't got time to be thinking about financial literacy. I ain't got time to be thinking about what I can use social media for. Man, I'm trying to get through the next week and the next week. And I just need to be stimulated enough to stay in survival mode so that I don't have to think about all the trauma I went through. Right. I want to stay emotionally numb because I got 20 partners that's dead. So I don't even want to start going through that because that's going to bring up issues that I'm not even ready to deal with. I'm going to get broken down and then I'm going to fall off to where somebody might catch me slipping. So that's the environment of somebody trying to that's the thought process of somebody trying to survive in the street. So. You throwing the music, yeah, the music got me turned up. This music is conducive to me doing things that I feel like is going to make me survive more in the streets. But I consider it slow suicide, right? A lot of them are on a path towards slow suicide. 
whether it's the drugs, whether it's the environment they into, you're doing things that you know can either cause you death, right? And you don't mind putting yourself in harm's way. One of the things that we do with individuals like that is, is really same thing as if you're taking them into a clinic, right? And, and unfortunately, we don't have a clinic in the community, so we work with the whole ecosystem that interacts with this individual. And so we are removing him from that or her and then slowly changing their mindset, Show, slowly tra detoxing them from that habit and giving them a new habit, right? So we use Queen of Fools products to do a detox, to clean their bloods out because it, it helps. Because what you eat is also, as you talked about so many times, what you become, right? And so, and then at the same time, exposing them to success in building their own business. Like with our young people, we used to do teen party. Whatever they like to do, I said, like whatever you, I'm gonna show you how you do it as a business. If you like to sleep, you could go test beds for companies, yeah. right? If you like to party, you could be a party promoter. Yeah. But whatever you like to do, I showed them how that could be a business and help them become entrepreneurs. So then once they see they're making money and having fun, and I don't have to do that, then we're the new gang. Right? And it's cool and it's fun and it helps you grow in life, right? And so we don't, and then you're making music, they start from that. Like we had one young lady, she, like, she was, I'm a rapper, I'm not a poet, but like, just try it. And she went in and she did it, she won the whole contest, mm -hmm. you know, at the Knicks Poetry. And now she just won $25,000 20 years later with uh, Remy Ma's Battle Rap, mm -hmm. right? And she created a whole program called Pain on Beats because she attempted suicide five different times, right? Because of the trauma of trying to get out. Because trying to, to get out is a, is, is a, is a thing, yeah. It's just traumatic. And so I got, I got a, a five-year-old boy and a three-year-old boy. And we got the five-year-old boy when he was like two years old. It's our first kid, you know. And he used to like throw these temper tantrums. And when I was young, and I seen the kid throwing a temper tantrum in church, right? Parents used to snatch him up. Boy, quit crying, I'm gonna give you something to cry for, right? And this is how we responded to a temper tantrum. But I was like, you know, I responded like that. I'm like, man, you better, you know, man, be quiet. What are you crying for? Why are you screaming? Boy, don't scream in the grocery store. You embarrassing me, right? And I, I was responding like that for a whole month. And I seen him get worse and worse. I'm like, okay, well, my input is not you know, giving me desired output. I have to change my input. So I begin to research. This is why I love the generation we live in now, because, you know, you have no excuse anymore yeah. to have a lack of information. You know, you can ask Siri. We were laughing about Siri earlier, right? So I went deep into the, 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 the two to five year old brain development, right? And, you know, at that time, he was having temper tantrums. He was literally, not understanding why the chemicals in his brain was happening. I tell him he can't have something. He's physically shaking because the neural pathways don't have any synapses yet. They don't have no direction. So he like, what the hell's going on? Daddy just told me no. All I asked for was him to buy me some juice at the store. So he's going crazy because he can't regulate his own internal processes. And I'm like, wow, right? So, you know, I, I found this lady. You know, she's a very nice lady, you know, online. And she was like, well, you have to work with them through the process. <laughs> I started working with him through the process. And I'm in a store one day. And I think it was Walmart. I'm, I'm back in Stockton. The only store we got by the house was Walmart. I, I go into Walmart, buy some diapers, and he gets to screaming. He gets to screaming. He wants underwear. I'm like, you wear diapers. I want underwear. I want underwear. First off, I should have let him buy the underwear. Secondly, I was like, it's going to be okay. Tell me how you're feeling. I'm on my knees in Walmart. <laughs> Tell me how you're feeling. I'm mad. Okay, why are you mad? You told me, and I, we had a conversation. I'm on my knees, and I'm, and I'm looking at myself like, damn, I look like one of them white people. But it hit me right there. This is how they train in their children to help process and build the neural pathways to build healthy habits, thinking habits, to way, when, when they're viewing the world, they're not viewing the world through a trauma lens. They're viewing the world through a problem solving, how do I conquer lens? That's why they became conquerors. Right, so I began to do that with him. Then I went, my research took me down another pathway when I was doing research for the bill, right, for the bill we passed in California, for expungement bill. And I wanted to, I wanted to know, I wanted to have a rebuttal argument 
for the cops who are going to say, well, more black people commit crime. That's why more black people have, you know, um, criminal records, which is which is, you know, a valid argument. Right. Which is a straightforward argument. But I'm like, why are we committing crime? OK, we commit crime. Why are we committing crimes? And it broke me when I found the research that black parents don't do what I was doing with my kid. So we're building, we're literally building bad neural pathways to where if I'm told no, when I get older, that, that, that me being told no leads to aggression. So now I resent authority. I resent somebody telling me no. If somebody stepped on my shoes, you disrespected me. And then when I hit puberty, it just explodes. That's why a lot of young black boys, when they're 13, 14, my dad told me, he felt like, yo, the, um, I got uh, uh, snatched up by the body snatchers. I turned into a whole different person. And it leads to alcohol, it leads to criminality, it leads to in, um, increased suicide. That, that three to five year old range in young black boys and young black girls, in particular black boys, because we, you know, more, more testosterone hits us when we're 13 or 14, is crucial. It's crucial. That's why early childhood development is crucial. And we're not seeing that. So when you think about the built environment, take it back to the 70s, right? All them dudes go to war. They come home from war, right? Um, and they addicted to heroin, right? Or our, our didn't come home. All of the mental health hospitals, we had deinstitutionalization, right? They closed down the mental health hospitals. And then in the same urban centers, we had uh, um, these cities were deindustrializing. All the factories were closing down. So we had a trifecta. We had mental health, um, no mental health support. We had people coming home from the war and we had rapid job loss, right? These young men, these young women that were raising these kids didn't have the mental capacity to sit down and be like, it's okay, three to five year old. Look, we got to figure out how to take care of this household. You know, you stay in a child's place. 80s hit, crack hits, war on drugs, extracting the men out the home, extracting the women out the home. Those kids were traumatized. Trauma begets trauma. Crisis becomes crime. So what ends up happening is year over year over year after civil rights, we end up with trauma, traumatized kids from the age of three to five that have bad neural pathways. So what you're doing, what the nation does, what the military does, is it rewires your neural pathways. That's why when we talk about psilocybin, it's the best thing going right now because it's allowing people to rewire their neural pathways. When you take somebody out their environment and say, what you're feeling is okay. All the things you're feeling is okay. When you get angry, it's okay. When you get mad, it's okay. When you get sad, it's okay. When, you are, when you're thinking about all the trauma that happened in the past with you, losing loved ones and losing homies, it's okay, but it's not okay to react in a way that causes more trauma, right? So rewiring the pathways is the most important thing. It is literally the brain sign. Our people are brain sick because we didn't have the, the, the know-how and the knowledge to be able to stop that when it was being created. And it's all about the creation. If you don't stop it when it was being created, you can have a hard time stopping it, you know, when, when, um, when a person is, you know, 16, 17 year old. Who was it that said, I'd rather deal with a child than a, an adult, right? Like, because it's easier to help build those neural pathways, healthy neural pathways and thinking patterns in a child than it is to rewire somebody when they're an adult. Peace Family 19 Keys. You know we gotta pay the bills, so this episode is brought to you by Smart Moss Gold. We call it smart because it has lion's mane in it. Lion's mane is a nootropic. Nootropics are things that help you with cognitive function and enhancement. That's talking about the brain. The reason that I can come on here, have conversations, and remember things, have recall, retention, focus, clarity of mind without the brain fog, right? It's because I take that lion's mane consistently so that it is always in my system, helping my brain regrow that matter, right? Helping with the myelination, which is just talking about electricity that flows between the neurons, which is the information that you have in your brain. So sometimes you get stuck and you're like, I can't remember. You need some of that small moss gold, right? It also, of course, has CBD, the gold powder in it. And then, of course, it famously has sea moss. So you're going to be getting those minerals, those nutrients. You're going to get that overall well-being. Your body's going to feel good. And you're going to be getting smarter on these. So I take two of these every single day. You take them throughout the month, and you're going to see great results. So make sure you go to goldewater.com. So, yes, we sell more than gold water. 
right? All of this is about remineralizing, especially in the world where we are deficient of minerals and we are over chemicalized. Make sure you tap in, get your small moss gold right now. Peace. Stay hollow. Now, I think what you said speaks to the root, which is where a lot of people never speak on. Even when I see a lot of shit on social media, a lot of times I'm not against what the person is saying, but they're not going deep enough, which doesn't allow them to have empathy of the why, right? You, you're kind of throwing a tantrum like a child when you're just looking at the what. They didn't do this or they did this. It's like, but why, right? Because we don't have a lot of empathy for our people a lot of times when we deal with each other, which is why we use so much harsh language. These niggas ain't shit. These hoes ain't nothing. It's like, but how and why did they get there? Because now if we can have an understanding, even as adults, so we can think through this issue, now we can understand the why so we can prevent it and create solutions so that it doesn't occur again. Otherwise, it becomes repetition. Somebody I want to have on the show, his name is uh, Dr. Amen, I, mean, I believe, and he talked about, similar to what you talked about when it comes to doing brain studies. Because we talk about mental health, we don't talk about brain health a lot, right? And when he did scans of the brain, he can see where there was basically, you know, these spots in the brain, you know, where if these people went through therapy to help fix these areas, then they would lose a lot of that aggression. They would lose a lot of those issues and problems. But we can't, you know, and, 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 and he did that by, of course, having a whole entire brain scan and taking people through it and then working people through therapy to fix that area and then doing another brain scan. And then that issue is no longer there. Right. But. If we go talk mental health in America, it's not like in Atlanta they want to build 85 million for a cop city. And people say, no, that has to be deployed with actual resources that make an impact so that you prevent the crime from happening in the first place. And like you said, that starts in the household. That starts with early childhood development. That starts with education. That starts with increasing starts with giving people life. quality life. Yeah, you know what I'm talking. Yeah, I was get, I was getting there. I was getting there. <laughs> because when you look in our neighborhoods, when you talk about those three and five year olds, they're giving them Ritalin and Thorazine and all kind of drugs. Told them to go to sleep. Right? Yeah. Yes. You know, and that's real. That has a real impact. Yeah. And so you talk about all of these things that have happened, and then taking all the resources up, the redlining, right? The making it a law that you can have your husband in the house or your father of your children. Right, these things intentionally destroyed family, intentionally destroyed lives. My father never came back from the war. He died in the Vietnam War, right? We shouldn't even have been over there. Mm. Right, so you intentionally created a war that killed and dehumanized and destroyed people that came back and now continue to destroy people, right? And so, like, when you talk about you can't negate all of that imbalance. And then you go back to slavery, that trauma of the transatlantic slave trade, and then being a slave, being whipped, being separated, being killed, being hung, that had real impact. And so people are trying to get at the, get at the, level, the playing field, right? And there's intentional laws that are made to continue to hold us on the bottom, so that a certain level of people can remain on top. And so when people, and why, why do we got to fight? Why does got to be a life camp? Why, like, why do we have to even exist? Right? And that, that should be the real, why don't our children, two conversation is death or in jail? Right? Why is that even a conversation? These things are intentional. And so as we work on social media or grow through the society or make music, right? At some point, at some time, we're going to have to relook at that man or woman in the mirror and say, like, no, nah, I want to sing something different, right? I want to stand on a different square and really help expose or change or transform or educate so that we can begin to live different because we don't have to live like this. And people continue to say that, and we continue to live like this, right? Because we continue to vote for the biggest fool, right? We continue to get bamboozled into these parties that don't benefit us, mm -hmm. right? And we just, they give us a big check, we go out there and get people to go vote for them, right? Mm -hmm. People come home, they want to work around gun violence because gun violence is where the money's at, right? It was AIDS before, we want to work around AIDS. It's homelessness, we want to work around homelessness. Don't work around something for a check. 
work around it for because you're committed to making conditional changes in our community with our people, right? And until these, these you know, we got to continue to, you know, as you have these high-level conversations, you're bringing out a new audience, right? You're waking up a young generation. So when you talked before about the code, you're helping to bring a new code and standard, right? Because people are dressing like you now. They're talking like you now. And the same thing with you, right? You've, you've impacted a lot of credible messengers you don't even know, right? Because you came in and said, no, I'm not going to do that. No, you're not going to call me that. No, you're going to allow me to go to my children's school, right? And so these type of, of work that we're doing, and the same thing with me, is being a black woman in this, like, when you, saw, when you, when you said we're going to do a conversation together, and you was like, you know, I'm going to put you and Jay together because y'all are like, I'm like, I ain't like Jay. Like, I'm a black woman. I'm a queen. I'm 58 years old. He's a kid to me, right? How am I like him? But then I started talking to him. And I'm like, yo, this brother's just like me. He was here before, <laughs> right? And I, I adopted him as my son. <laughs> but, and so we have judgment on each other, right? We have jealousy and envy on each other, right? And, and, and until we get rid of these things, we can't really make fundamental change because you, you know, a lot of people say to me, yo, yeah, I love you, I care about you, but they're the same ones who bring me to illness because they bring me to stress, yeah, right? And so I know for me, I have to protect my soul, right? And so I have to separate from individuals. I have to separate from different kinds of work because I just, I'm not healthy enough to do it anymore, number one, because, and the, the, being unhealthy is, is, is because I need to do something else. Because I'm 58. I can't do the same thing I was doing at 22. <laughs> I just physically, you physically can't, number one. And then in, intellectually, you shouldn't be. No, not at all. You know? And that's what young people are, are for, is to continue to pass the baton. And I believe in passing the baton. And so when we talk about changing culture or, or bringing a new code to the street, or not even having a code to the street, it just exists. Mm -hmm. Right? Because we had a code forever. That's how we, you, you know that don't happen in this house, mm -hmm. right? You, there's things you could do in the house and there's things you couldn't because there was a code in your house. There was a way that you work with your kids, right? And so it's an, un, it's an unannounced code, but we got to get back to some order, mm -hmm. right? And we got to get back to some discipline. We got to get back to respecting the work, right? And, 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 and social media has taken us to a space, but... That's not the answer. There's so many, like, when I went to Bali this, this summer, I'm like, there's a whole bunch of people who don't know any of them people over there. They ain't on your timeline. They, and there's billions of people, mm -hmm. you know? And so, although you might have a million followers, a billion followers, there's still a billion more, mm -hmm. right? And so tap into your community and really grow the, the and, and you were saying something earlier about, like, everybody's a leader, and I understand what you're saying about in, in internal leader because you can only change yourself. Well that and then just just kind of just rephrasing and looking at when you a leader is the one in front. Right? But then you always in front of somebody else. You know, if you look at a march and it's thirty thousand people, somebody's in front of you. Somebody is leading you and then somebody's leading that person. So for me it's just saying that everybody's leading somebody. You might not be the one in front, right? But if you go in the wrong direction, you lead people in the wrong direction. Right? So you leading whether you know it or not, just by following. And then that follower may be following a the vision. They may be following the code. They may be following an idea, a passion. So they're being led by something, right? That's leading them. But everybody has this responsibility. If, if everybody sees themselves as a leader, now they can't say it's just on the person who came up with the idea. It ain't just on the person who organized. It's on everybody involved. And that's, a, that's the important part of like, understanding like knowledge of what we're up against, right? It's like, cause I, I know folks who are in the movement that don't know the history, right? So it's like, oh, we gonna do bail reform. And they hop in bail reform cause they feel like bail is racist. You know, the bail system is racist. So they hop in bail reform and they move it, move it, move it. And I'm like, yo, do you know why bail was instituted in the first place? You know what I mean? Are they like, you know, we need to abolish prisons, you know? And they hop into this abolition movement and they want to move it, move it, move it down the field. 
don't even realize, do you know why, not from Michelle Alexander's book, which is a great book, but go a layer deeper than that. Go a layer deeper than that. Do you understand why we have the built environment we live in? Do you understand why there's liquor stores and there's mega churches and there's bail bonds on every street and there's more liquor stores than there are child development centers, right? Do you understand how we got here? There are two books that I recommend everybody read. And um, I, I, I definitely, um, um, uh, uh, the sister today, when I was talking to her this morning, Professor Elizabeth Hinton out of Yale, formerly out of um, Harvard, she was like, cite black women. I'm like, so I'm gonna cite some black women. So Carol Anderson, White Rage. If you haven't read that book, Carol Anderson, White Rage is, I think, explains Trump, explains White Lives Matter, explains the visceral response to civil rights, the black coats, all of it. It just, she takes you through all of it. And you're like, oh, it makes a lot of sense. Another book, if you're in the justice reform, public safety, safety movement, whatever it is, like violence intervention, Elizabeth Hinton wrote this book. It's called From the War on Poverty to the War on Crime, The Making of Mass Incarceration in America. This is the single most intellectually stimulating book about public safety I have ever read in my entire life, and it breaks down how we got here. If you read that book, I, that, that book should be in every single household and broken down in layman's terms because it's kind of academically challenging to read for a lot of folks, but if you get into it and you listen to her speeches, you Google Professor Elizabeth Hinton on, you, on YouTube, listen to her speeches, you're going to be astounded by what happened. Right. So if you look at before you get into that, and I want you to hold that thought, but you said something about Trump just because he is actually a very relevant conversation to the politics and activism today. I want to know what was her thought process on what is the Trump thing? Why is Trump successful? Not Trump. Let me just be very clear. Trump is the cough. He's not the sickness. Right. Trump is the mucus. He's not like, you know, I mean, he's, he's, he is a symptom of something deeper in America, and he tapped into something deeper in America, which is white rage. Every time there is black advancement, there is a counter rage that happens amongst white people. Look at um, when the Emancipation Proclamation was signed. In the book, she, she explains what happened in the, in the following few years not only politically and, and, and legislatively, the black codes were passed, which, you know, in, com in comic leasing, which was like, you know, laws that were passed that basically said, if you were black, then we could arrest you and put you back into the plantation and you were still a slave, you know, which is the black code. There's a bunch of black codes. We still have some black codes, which is called collateral consequences today. But it was also just massive murder. Massive murder. There was a reporter that went down to the South. They didn't believe it. And they went down to the South and you know, in the South, they got those trenches on the side of the roads. Black bodies line the trenches. Babies cut out of the mama's womb just because they were black and they were free. It was a visceral response to like black advancement. And then you look at what happened um, with, with Black Wall Street. Visceral response to black economic building. They do not like black people having money collectively, right? Visceral response, look at civil rights. Visceral response, we built an entire prison system because black folks got rights. And I want to put a pin in that because that's where I want to like take this conversation around the built environment and how, on how we got here. Whether or not you like Obama or you think Obama did whatever he did, Obama stood for something that white folks did not like. Right? White, um, and when I say white folks, not all white folks, but white America, the, 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 and the thing that represents white America, that whiteness, that culture, it's a white culture in America that is inherently racist. Period, right? Obama was elected, white folks went crazy. My dad had a church. My dad had a church, and it was a multiracial, Pentecostal, non-denominational church. Fire, fire and brimstone breathing, praying, and you falling out, people shaking, speaking in tongues. Multiracial coalition was a part of the city. People loved my pops in Stockton, California, right? Moved his church to Eastside Stockton because of the eminent domain. Eastside Stockton is historically a white community where all the... Um, on white folks from Oklahoma migrated to Stockton and they built a community called Eastside Oakieville, right? All the white folks, and now there are a bunch of migrants there, migrant workers there that are working in Latinos. So it's a mixture of community, but people were still coming from all across the city. My pops had 400 members. 2008, Obama elected. My dad got on, got in front of the 
congregation and said, I am glad we got a black president. Ask me what happened to the white folks in this congregation. They left. They left. They left. Like, systematically, Obama was the only president where they were talking about his clothes. I just seen something the other day where they had this man go on um, Tucker Carlson and said that he had sex with Obama. No other president would be disrespected like that. Whether or not you, oh, you like Obama, you, you don't like Obama. And then in 2016, it was that Trump movement was an anti-Obama movement. It was an anti, it was a response to having a black president and black folks feeling like we finally made it. Even though we didn't, even though Obama did a whole lot of harm to other countries and bombed and, you know, we can talk about that. But what he represented was black progress, even though if it was real or not, he represented that to them. They perceived it as black progress. They said, we're going to get the most whitest, the most racist, the most wealthiest, purest, make America great again. That was Nixon's campaign slogan. This right here, make America great again. The same policy, you know, turn people against migrants coming from, really refugees coming from the South. We all turn against them. They're taking our job. I heard black folks talking about, you know, Mexicans taking our jobs. What? No, they not. You want to get your ass in that field? You want to get your ass in, in dig trenches? You ain't doing that work. Right? That, that was white rage. And Trump represented the white, the white culture of America, the wealthy white culture of America, even though he wasn't even that. He was just some rich, white, white spoiled dude that made it big in real estate. And his pops gave his pops was racist. But Trump was a reality star. He was a, he was a, he was a culture icon. He was a cultural icon. We all love Trump, but they re for, for them, they, it, Trump represented white culture, and that was an anti-Obama movement. And you can see throughout history in the book that she paints that very, very well. I don't think Trump represented anything more than that. And now what you see now is, you know, those MAGA folks who, you know, I have, I have friends who voted for Trump and will still vote for Trump because his economic, they feel like his economic policy was better for them. Whether or not, you know, you believe it or not, right, they feel that way. And I don't down anybody for feeling any type of way. I don't say that you're right or wrong. You have a right as an American to feel that way, and they will vote for Trump. I do believe now that that subset of America, right, those few million people, those, what is this coalition now? Like, you know, what is it, 10 million or something like that? 10 million, 8 million, whatever you got, 4 million folks who will vote for him if he was in San Quentin right now, right? Like... That that those those, those folks those Marguerite uh, those Marguerite Green like those folks aren't all the way there, you know what I mean? Some of those folks are just literally saying things to provoke and to espouse this racist anti-Obama anti-black rhetoric, and we saw it all throughout um, Obama's presidency, and Trump rode that wave. And, you know, while it isn't the full Republican Party, I don't believe that all Republicans are racist. Hell no. My dad is an ex-Republican. You know, I know, I know a lot of Republicans because they're, they're conservative, they're, they're religious conservatives. They don't believe in abortion. They don't believe in gay marriage. That's just what their religion calls for. I get that. You have that right. Do I agree with you? You know, I may not, you know, but that's your right. Not all that side of the aisle, you know, is that way. And there are some Democrats who believe in that white culture as well. Right. And so Trump represented that for a lot of people on the right and on the left and in the middle. Mm. It's a lot in that to unpack. <laughs> um, just just briefly on that, because we had an interesting, I think, state and day, um, because I think from the original symbolism that he represented for that core base, like you said, those however many million, he still represent that. I think for. This generation today, he just represents a different America than the traditional America, right? And so it's, it's almost like black people having white rage in the sense to where it's like we tired of the traditional white man and things going as usual. And because of social media and access to information, and especially America is in this place where it no longer feels like America. America started off conservative and traditional values, started off with, you know, Bible belt, right? And the Constitution was based on the Bible. But now it's no longer this Christian place. There's less Christians than ever in America. And America is a very godless country today. So it's, it's almost now you have progressive versus conservative. 
And people are now in this belief of whoever is going to represent old America is who they want, but at the same time represent some policies that can be fruitful when it comes to economics, right? And what they believe is they get in a wild card versus we know exactly what comes with this card. And people will rather spin the dice, right, get in the future that is more uncertain than the certain one that we already tired of, right? So... It's, 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 we've always been sold in America the lesser evil, which there's no such thing because we're just given evil. We've never been given good, right? And so when you're always sold evil as a choice, right, then people started picking and say, okay, well, shit, if, you know, maybe I don't want the, want the lesser evil no more. Maybe I want this nigga's going to be more evil because he's going to destroy America more, which may be good for the people at the bottom because he's going to shake things up. And so it's this, it's this interesting phase that we in in society, whether it's good or bad, whether it's light or dark, whether it's left or right, you know, it's all, you know, the same bird, you know, just different sides of the wings. And, and we've been sold the same thing over and over, the same tactics over and over. And we can no longer get to a place where it's about us fighting for, you know, us trying to get this person out of office because then it becomes the same tactic that they use that got Trump in office. Right. Well, no, just elect Biden. So Trump doesn't go. Well, just elect Trump. So, you know, so we don't get another Obama type character. We don't get Hillary Clinton. It's the same tactics that both sides use and prey upon the ignorance of the people. We want a generation of real solution. We want real change. And we would rather go through a period of darkness to get through real change because we feel like we already been through the dark. And so now we're more resilient than ever. Right. It's like you can't scare us with what, another four years of what? Like what you go scare us with? So it's the same thing with, you know, I think in every aspect uh, when we talk about society, because I think the larger conversation, we use the word culture a lot, which kind of niches us that this is just our problem, right? But it's like the work that you do, you get bills passed, bail reform, things of that nature. Like this is a societal systemic issues. Why is it that it's only if, if America is supposed to be in this place of advancement and there's no racism, then... And black people have been in America since it was before America, right? Then our issues, if we're all citizens of the same so-called great nation, should be your issues. Because these are issues of, of citizens of America. But they know that there's still racism just by the fact that there's the great divide that whatever's your problem is your problem, right? And now, not only that, we're going to argue you down that your problem don't even really exist. It's not even real. That, to me, is the proof of racism. Right. You can't have a bunch of people saying that, yo, we got issues, systemic issues, conflict issues, lack of education issues, family issues, agenda, emasculation, all these things going on. And they like, well, that's your problem. Matter of fact, that's not even a real problem. Y'all made that up. That's the racism itself. Right. I don't need to point to any other statistics. It's like, wait a minute. If there's a, a section of America to tell you they got issues. It should just be in America's best interest to help those people. The bureaucracy that they set up to deal with the issues. It's racist as well. Oh, man, it's, right. it's even worse than that. It, it, it's So JFK had a really good thought, the New Frontier. His New Frontier plan was a domestic policy, a, a litany of domestic policy that was supposed to eliminate poverty and uh, racial inequality. Obviously, he was murdered. He was assassinated. Lyndon Bain Johnson took, you know, the mantle and his 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 framing wasn't the the new frontier but it was the great society and it was a list of domestic programs that was implemented between 1965 and like 1968 and then and these programs I'm gonna read them it was job corps vista programs peace corps model cities upward bound head start neighborhood health centers welfare was implemented then national endowment for the arts national endowment for the humanities pbs the Kennedy Center, the FTA, federal minimum wage, they cut, um, they cut taxes across the board for corporations and people. And because they cut taxes and implemented all that stuff, black folks benefited as well. It rose all boats and the gross national product grew by 10%. The economy grew by 10%. That was huge. Black folks just got civil rights bill passed. And then in 68, right, um, it, was, it, was, it was urban unrest. And so what they did was they turned around, this is Lyndon Johnson, and said, how do we deal with the urban unrest? They, they, they passed the ominous um, um, street crime and safety bill, 
right? And this bill was the first time that, well, first it was the Law Enforcement Assistance um, um, Act, which was the first time the federal government sent money to local police departments. And then in 68, it was the Ominous Crime Bill. This was the first crime bill before the 94 that built the police state, right? And we're talking about the equivalent of three or four billion dollars investment in the police state. And what they did, this is the important part, what they did was, instead of them being like social problems and social initiatives, right? They said, let's merge the two. So they disguised crime policy as social policy. So instead of having a community health center just at the community health center, they had a community health center with a substation in it. This is the first time that substations actually went into black communities. You didn't have substations in the projects in, in the 60s. You had substations in the projects in the 70s and 80s. They began to flood our communities with law enforcement and the social program that were supposed to benefit us. They, the police didn't go to the white communities. They went to the urban cities, right, the, the urban centers. And again, as I said earlier, at that time, you had mental health hospitals closing. You had people coming home from war. And you had these large manufacturing um, uh, centers closing. America went from a manufacturing economy to a service economy, right? And so everything changed, and the urban centers began to have a lot more police. You know what else came with police? Jails and prisons, right? And so when, when, when black folks were asking for safety, were asking for you know, safe streets and safe neighborhoods, well, safe streets and better economic conditions for the neighborhood, for people inside, the federal government said, we're going to give you these programs, but you have, they have to be tied to the carceral state. So when the 80s hit and drugs hit our communities, which was imported by the government, by the way, let's just be all honest, right? It was imported in Oakland by the government, right? Like, they begin to fill those jails and prisons up, right? And, and those social programs, to your point, that were there for the women, you know, welfare and all that stuff, they said, well, you can't deal with, you can't have a criminal anywhere around the social program. So if you're a criminal, you can't be around a social pro, pro, program. The same thing that was going on with the building up of jails and prisons and the carceral state in America and the, um, and the building up of these social programs tied to the carceral state, what else happened was fast food joints start to move into neighborhoods, right? So you had the health component being snatched out. You had big box grocery stores. You had mega churches. So the spiritual centers on the, the storefront church or the church that used to go to all the time, that was snatched out of, out of the neighborhood. In the 90s, what happened in the 90s, right, people were calling for safe streets and safe communities. And the whole, when people talk about the C Congressional Black Caucus voting for the 94 crime bill, that's a nuanced conversation. Because while black folks were saying we want more safety, we want more social programs, what the Republicans did, right, well, they tied all that stuff in together. So when they were voting for a crime bill, they were voting for social program, but that was the only way they can get the social programs, right? The only way to get the program. So let's, let's backtrack. In the 70s, right, we were calling for safety and economic empowerment. We got the war on crime, right? In the 80s, we were calling for safety and economic empowerment. We got the war on drugs. In the 90s, we were calling for safety and economic empowerment. We got the 94 crime bill and the war on drugs. I mean, and the war on crime. In the 2000s, get this, in the 2000s, 2001, 2001, when those towers fell, America came together. I, I never seen so many black revolutionaries and everybody else talking about being proud to be an American, being pissed off. I was pissed off. Like, damn, they came over here and, and, and brought the towers down, they really attacked us? Like, damn. You have some people saying, well, America deserved it, but for the most part, everybody was like, damn, that's fucked up. That's, fu that's fucked up. We were asking for national security. We got the war on terror and the expansion of the government, of, of the government bureaucracy, right? They expanded um, TSA. TSA was not around before 20, 2001. Homeland Security, which is a large government department and a surveillance, domestic surveillance of, of Americans was not around, right? In, in 2010, in, 20, um, in 2011, in 2012, we were calling for safety and, and, and the cops to not kill black people. And they, they were calling when black people were in the streets, they were saying, oh, they're thugs, right? And so every time black folks, since, the, since civil rights, every time we've asked for something, the government expanded itself. And that's the fundamental problem when you look at the built environment. When you talk about health 
and safety and how do we get out of the rut that we're in, there are, we have, we as a people have to look internally and say, we need, we need a different strategy, right? And what did that look like? There's a lot of conversations that need to be had about that, right? Um, and I believe that now at the time we are experiencing something that they experienced in the 70s, that there was like the government, there was large scale government interruption in the Black Panthers, you know, and, 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 and that stopped that. But now we can, like with the technology, we can do a lot in terms of figuring shit out because if we don't, what's gonna happen is government's gonna expand itself again. Government has a responsibility to expand itself. It expanded itself after um, um, uh, 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 exp it expanded itself after the um, the war, right? The um, the Civil War. It expanded itself after the um, Great Depression, the Great New Deal. My God, it expanded itself hugely. It expanded itself after civil rights, and it expanded itself after the war uh, um, after 9/11. And so, if we don't begin to look internally and say, okay, well, what is our collective strategy? And I believe what EYL is doing. And what, I mean, like, violent interventionists literally putting y'all's life on the line is doing, like, merging those strategies of, like, financial revolution, economic revolution, you know, um, um, kind of like safety rev revolution with a spiritual revolution and bringing all those things together. And then, and then turning to the system and saying, this is what we want, because right now you have movements that are, like, trying to throw rocks at a system that will always be there. The government will always be there. Police are government. Jails are government. Prisons are government. That's the government that we're trying to fight against. That government will always be there. And I believe now is the moment, but I, like the built, the built environment and the streets were made in a very intentional, strategic, and well-funded way with tax dollars from the very people that it affects. And that is, for me, crazy. Peace, family. I know it's a whole lot of AI talk. But understand that we do have one place that you can go to to check out all of the top AIs, the ones that have been made and the ones that are being made, all of the newest ones. Go to thewarehouse.ai and you can see all of the AIs that we talked about from text to image to text to video to text to speech, right? The ones that you can clone yourself, whatever it is, keeping you up to date, go to thewarehouse.ai ASAP. Peace. I want to get into two things, and then I want to get your take on basically the strategies that you are currently using, and then how we can improve and what the future of this looks like. So, like for me, the next phase of government expansion is expansion, rather, of course, is just a complete social credit system, like in China. I always say China's present is America's future, right? America just doesn't have the tools to be able to roll out things as fast as China can. Right. With the expansion of the CBDC coins and things of that nature, where the government can decide, hey, Jay, I don't like the way you talking. Then therefore, you can't shop in certain grocery stores. Your money is no good. They can cut off your wallet. Right. So therefore, not only that, somebody can't send you money. Right. Because they're controlling the money. So it's like things of that nature is already done in China. You can jaywalk across the street. They take your picture and automatically take money out your wallet. Right. And then put your picture on a bulletin board. Right. As somebody who just committed a crime. So therefore, it's a instant deterrent against crime. Right. And unless you are connecting your identity to these wallets, because we already live in a world where it's already the de-dollarization. You can't go to most places and spend money. Right. A lot of places talking about they don't take cash. So we already go into a cashless society and that's already government expansion by giving them the ability to not only print money, but to destroy money, right? And to control the money that you have, right? Because now if you create a system like they did, I believe it was in Nigeria. Nigeria is one of the first ones to come out with the CBDC coin where they had it set up where people weren't using it at first, right? Right, but what happened was is that people didn't want to use it, so they told them, and I'm gonna mess up some of the points, they told them that they was coming out with a new dollar that they can use and that didn't come out. And instead, people were forced because the only way that they was able to go get some money and be able to buy something to eat and continue a you know, living situation was if they actually used these CBDC coins. So they essentially starved these people until they used the money, right? And it's the same thing with the welfare system. You don't bring, if you bring the man in the house, we're not gonna give you no money, right? That's a form of control, right? So now we can control the family dynamics. 
we know how much you're making. If you make too much money, we ain't giving you no more money. So it's basically putting, you know, all of America on welfare, right? Taking that same exact type of system and having control over what you say, what you think, what you do. We've seen that happen on social media. Every social media company has an agreement with the government, right? So these are partners. So imagine you now take that same agreement and they say that, okay, not only if this person says something on social media that we demonetize them, but we also demonetize the rest of their life as well, right? What happens if you can't pay your bills because the government said your money no good, right? So now they control what you say, right? They control what you do, how you act, who you interact with. So that expansion of the government gives them so much power over everything that at that point, that's the end game. Because what else do they need to do when they can control your living and your money? Oh, people go shut up fast. Most people don't want to stand next to a, a revolutionary activist or a radical because they, are, they don't want to mess with the money. Because when somebody can feed you, then they control when you eat. And if you don't eat, you starve. So they control your life. Like you said, when the movement leaders start taking the funds from the corporations, the corporations control the movement. Otherwise, they cut off the funds. Right? So it's the same thing with the people, and that's just a trickle effect. So yeah, there's an expansion in government to control society, right? Not just black people. Black people are a small aspect of it, right? But if you want to make America great, the easy plan for national interest would be take a look at the people who are getting it the worst. Black men have the worst statistics out of all groups, from health, economics, to education, right? So, it, it, and of course, we get no funding, right, for our ideas. You don't get funding for you know, some brilliant idea you have to change the world. None of that money's coming to you. None of that money's coming to black women. They created a situation where they separated black men and women and see themselves as different entities, right? So this is a black women's fund. You've never seen a black man's fund, ever. I've never in my life seen a fund from any corporation ever saying this is specifically for black men because of systematic issues that they face in America. Never in my life. Today, I see minority, people of color, Women fund because we need you to separate your identity and your advancement from the black man, right? So it's another system of division and control, right? So until it gets to a place to where, number one, if, if we are the greatest influencers of America, right? And America's power is waning because it's losing influence over the world. People don't want to be like Americans anymore, right? They'd rather be like, you know, some other aspect of the world or be like themselves, and or military occupation. So we're in the face of the end of an empire and now they have to figure out all of the tools to maintain power because there's no historical reference for what happens after this besides demise. So when you're facing fall, you're gonna do everything you can to continue to maintain power. So the most desperate thing they can do <laughs> would be to try to empower black men and black women to bolster the GDP and the influence of America because that would put America back into a grandstanding, but we don't have equity in America. So when we talk about the fall of America, people feel like, well, that's not my company falling, that's your corporation, right? So a lot of our issues, we feel like they're cultural issues and we don't feel connected to society. So even when we speak on it, we always speak about culture. We never speak about society. So society says that, well, shit, y'all don't talk about us. That's not my problem, right? So, and that goes from the corporate lens because they like, okay, we can help solve a diversity, inclusion, equity problem, right? But that might not be big enough right now for us. We need something that solves a societal problem. So now you have to take the issues that's going on in the streets and say, well, mental health is a society problem. The youth disillusionment is a society problem, right? The lack of financial literacy globally is an issue, right? Especially in America because the citizen's not smart enough to make more money and take advantage of technology and the different trades and skills to bring more money to America. America is dumb right now, right? The, 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 so when we talk about our issues, they're like, okay, well, how is decreasing the prison population going to help America? How is increasing the mental health of the black community going to help America? Right? Now, we know that, well, I don't know about America, but it's going to help us. <laughs> but then it does help America. I don't see how it wouldn't because there's less crime. Right? There's, there's, there's more people that's increasing income. Right? There's more companies being made. There's but more jobs, them, higher quality of living. But for them, that, the lawyers, the judges, the doctors, the prison, what, that this is, they live off, some of these towns upstate uh -huh. solely live off the prison. Mm. 
Right? And so when you talk, because, you know, it's a lot to remember, and I'm not as young as y'all, but um, when you were talking about the programs that they put in, yeah. right, those were intentional to distract. Because why they got to put programs in? Yeah. Right? Why need a welfare program? Why is society upside down? Right? And so why is it, like, why are there no police in Bayside riding around? Why is there no police over here in Manhattan on the Upper West Side riding around, right? It's not that black people create more crimes, right? It is because they have created our community to be crime driven, right? And as you said in, in, in several times, that's all they're feeding in our community. It's criminal activity. It's this music that takes our, our mentality to a, a, a low vibration, right? You talk about it all the time. These things are intentional to keep them in a way, because where are these judges going? Where are they going if there's no crime? Right? Where are all of these lawyers going? Yeah, I mean, yeah. I... Right? And so this is the meat of how they, they live off of us. And, it's the, and, the, and collectively, if you, like, the U.S. justice system is the second largest employer in the world. Right. Like 2.5 million people, $300 billion every single year. And what they don't tell us is, okay, well, we have to have a crime response system because we don't have a traditional public safety system. We don't. Like all the laws that were passed, like in California alone, from 1970 to 2020, there were a thousand tough on crime. Crime policy bills passed, a thousand, and crime ebbs and flows. The problem with. 2012, we started doing. CMS. 2015, 16, that time span of four years, we had no shootings in our target area. We had 500, we had no killings, I'm sorry, in our target area. We had four years, no one killed, right? Then we had 562 days, nobody shot. We had a whole weekend in New York City where no guns went off. No guns went off, right? That's, that's like, no guns went off. <laughs> in New York. In New York, right? We had a week where no one was killed. And how much did that cost, y'all? It, it definitely doesn't cost what it costs the police, right? Yeah. But it works. How did you accomplish it? Right, we accomplished it by, like I said, working with that ecosystem around those high-risk individuals. The people who had the highest potential to be shot or to shoot someone at the same time, changing community norms, right? Working with the community to see these individuals different, to see their cells different, right? But you need resources to do all of that, right? You need buy-in from the men and women in the community, like you talked about before. The people gotta be the movement, the movement gotta be the people, right? Both of y'all talked about that. If, let me ask you. And before you say that, this society intentionally does not reinvest and build what works. It defunds it. Correct. So that's, that's part of the question. And go start doing something else. And give it to police and then, and then they pay for, you know, the, 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 the police hardware and then crime goes up. <laughs> What's your ideal number to fund like something that you've done? So we Pretty went good. to Biden, for example, and said we wanted him to invest $5 billion. We worked it all out and said that if you invest $5 billion, and that's on a low ball level, mm -hmm right, that these different hot areas across the nation, we'd be able to have that. And so that bill is still waiting to be passed, right? That's only $5 billion, and they're spending $300 billion on just responding to crime, not preventing crime. They're just... They also gave Ukraine $326 trillion, right? And that was that period. They probably gave them more by now, right? So, and I say all of that to say... $326 billion, right? Did they? I don't know. You said trillion. <laughs> Check it out. I think they gave trillion. But um, but because why they want that Ukraine? Like anyway, we're not even gonna go there because that's a whole nother thing. That's a whole yeah, right. That's a whole other high level conversation. But but what is what is high level is to understand that they want to keep you on a low level, mm -hmm. right? And the reason why 19 Keys is pushing high level. Is for us to begin to look at even the question of knowledge. What was the last book you you raised books 
When's the last book to the individual? You used to have to go in the corner and give you a mathematics. Today's mathematics is God. It's seven, right? It's a God, right? And y'all are God body. But people were challenged for knowledge, right? Where are we challenging knowledge? Yeah, right? I, I think that the, the, uh, we're at a values deficit in the society right now. And not just, so raising it up, not just black folks, it's period, we're at a value deficit. And what, and what we value, that, that value is skewed, right? We value bullshit, you know what I mean? Oh. And, and we will spend our <clears throat> monetary value, our time, we'll spend all of our time, what, eight hours a day, and then eight hours of sleep, so we got, what, eight hours left? We spend two, two, two or three hours, four hours, valuing social media, scrolling, another two hours eating, traveling. So our day is shot, right? And the money and, and the eight hours we spend making the monetary value, we spend half of it on just cost of living, more than half for a lot of people, and then the rest of it on bullshit. So the very value, the, our value system as Americans has always been skewed. You know what I mean? And, and Because when, who taught it to us, yeah, we, right? Who taught it to us? Like, the things that I was telling young people earlier today. Like, you're telling me something because your information source is feeding you ignorance. And, and, and with algorithms, it makes it worse, right? So we was talking to Bobby, and Bobby, shout out to Bobby Smurder, man, one of the most insightful young rappers out there. You know, he was saying that when he was inside, he would get youngsters coming from everywhere, and they would all sound the same, right? And if you look at it now in society, if you come from Oakland, I know you from Oakland. Right. Your lingo, if, if, if you're from Oakland and you ain't saying certain things, I'm gonna question like, where, where you really, are you from Vallejo a little bit? You, yeah, you, yeah. Like, you know what I mean? Are you from San Jose? You know what I mean? Like you from Santa Cruz? Well, yeah, yeah, where you? But he said, man, from the Bay to Chicago, to Detroit, to Miami, they all saying the same thing because what's happening is the algorithms, they are literally feeding these folks and they're thinking that everyone's thinking that. We're thinking that everybody's in black culture. We're thinking that everybody's thinking the same thing. And it's not. Like, I, I, I told you before the interview, I switched my settings on Twitter to be, I want to see what folks are tweeting in Nigeria and in Ghana, right? And in South Sudan and in South Africa. And my whole world view changed. My whole world, you can do the same thing on all social media platforms. You know, I've traveled to London, Toronto, Ghana, right, Egypt you know, um, all kind of different places around the world. We've sold out shows, theaters, some of the biggest places in the world. And a lot of people love to see the clips of our results. But I'm going to tell you where the biggest jewels and keys are is in the process. And the process is not always shown, but it is on Keys TV, right? The behind the scenes, the fights, the arguments, the masterminds. Right, the places that we go to, the people that we talk to, the thoughts that will never get into the editing room and just be shown on social media, we decided to give you unfiltered access. Unlocking the vault so you can tap into Keys TV. Episodes like 19 Minutes, new original shows that you've never seen, being able to see the full, and even being able to work with original talent and curate some of that good content that is at the highest level because the way we do things is different than everybody. That's why they follow our pattern. And on Keys TV, all you gotta do is tap into the movement and the revolution will be televised. Peace family, this is 19 Keys, this is 19 Minutes. When you focus on creating, the experience that you have of making money is going to be automatically dialed into that. Not in excuses, cause I don't live with excuses. I live with decisions. We're so fixated on the attention and not where the value actually is. Is that the success is not in completion. The success is in the execution. When I saw that, it turned me up to another level as far as what I'm able to know that I can accomplish. If they take my deal away right now, I know I'll find another way to get money. Yeah. Cause it's just the hustle in me, but. I feel like I'm always in that mode, bro. No matter what I'm doing, I'm taking something in. This doesn't mean we have to agree. It doesn't mean any of that, but we're sharing truth. That it's not your responsibility to stop triggering people. It's their responsibility to heal. My ancestral part is you do for your people. If they can understand rare human beings that build out all of their complexity and live around their gifts, skills, and talents.
I was in Ghana, that's one thing I, I it, it really, that was the farthest I felt away from America. And I felt completely outside of my thinking sphere, you know what I mean, of information and what people cared about. It was completely different. Number one, Ghana is one of the most peaceful countries in the world, right? The feeling, the energy of safety there is something I've never felt nowhere else. But it was like, you got to think like we walk around carrying our issues as like a pride, our problems in society, and we think everybody knows them, we think everybody cares about them. I mean, them people, like I said, they knew 50 Cent, but not everybody knew who Malcolm X was. Right, they know a lot of bits and pieces of our entertainment culture. They don't know about all our social activities and our social fights for justice, even though that that's really our greatest contribution to society, right? Not our entertainment, right? It's the amount of fights that we've had for not only ourselves, but the rest of the world has benefited from. Like uniquely black Americans are the greatest social warriors ever to exist, right? But that's not what the rest of the world knows us for. That's not our brand. We may think sometimes it's our brand because we personalize what we think about ourselves and project that onto others. But no, they look at you as, yo, y'all ignorant little Americans. Y'all go to the parties and they play with y'all like y'all nothing. But y'all come over here with the bravado like you're a god. And they like, how? When every image that we know about you is almost ignorant, right? So we don't control our media, which is an issue when we talk about solutions. It's like everybody was mad about the issue of love and hip hop. And they was mad the fact that some people weren't mad. And they like, how come you're not mad that she used a racial slur? And they like, well, everybody feels that people felt like, well, the whole entire show is a racial slur. Right? They say, how you go pick one part of it that you don't like when we said we didn't like none of it? Right? right? So we feel like, yeah, this is, you know, hypocritical in a sense and it's selective outrage because you're trying to get everybody else to agree with you that an aspect of this show is bad when we're saying the whole show is bad for the culture. And it is because it's demoralization. But the reality TV, when that whole thing came in, and it's, once again, it's intentional, right? And you know, you were just talking about the worldview, and when you look at the organization of African unity, right? Who's who? Who's the young people dealing with that, right? All of those different organizations that brought Africans across the the globe together with Africans here, you know, who's doing that now, right? We're we're social media influencers. Right? We're not people who are really building the bridge and connecting and continuing the legacy of folks like Samora Michelle, Alumbe Brath, right? Patrice Lumumba, and those different brothers and sisters who worked intentionally to connect the, the diaspora you know, of Africans across America. And so if we're not doing that, then at a certain time, it's going to die off with the elders. Oh, no, we do it. We connected, but we connected through entertainment. <laughs> we connected through. We know, we know, we know African artists and and African arts and culture like they know ours. Well, and that's if you not look at, connection. No, I'm We're saying. We're not building no, a I'm not financial. saying that's a good thing. Oh, I'm not oh, saying, I'm not saying that's a good you. thing. I got I'm you. saying like if you look at what there's there's a uh, um, there's a lot of folks in the diaspora right now that are experiencing the social economic and political deprivation that black folks in America experience and eerily at the same time frame and eerily at the same kind of levels. And if you look at it, it's like, oh shit, we're not the only ones going through this. And if you look at, you know, kind of the solutions, the reason the human rights frame resonates so deeply with me is because when you take it out of the civil rights frame, the civil rights frame is a nationalistic framework. You are a nationalist. You are saying, I want civil rights in my certain nation, um, in my certain nation. We say, I want human rights. Then you begin to look at a global picture and say, black folks weren't just dropped off in America. You know what I mean? In, in the United States, we we're dropped off all over the place. And in some areas like Brazil, they are exterminating whole favelas. You know what I mean? Just for being black. And I believe looking forward, I'm hopeful, I'm extremely hopeful because we can do that. Like the ones who came before, if they had to hop on a plane and go to those places and pass through customs and get past the Cointel Pro and then go to a secret meeting and then listen and then send telegrams and shit and then come back and like now we can just go and tweet or we can go and text or go on WhatsApp or Telegram or any one of the things and like build multinational coalitions both with arts and culture because we're doing with arts and culture. You know, we, we know it, it can work because literally Burner Man can do an album right now with Khaled. You know what I mean? Like, we, we can do it, right? But, like, 
we haven't made those connections. And I love the fact that more and more black Americans are going over to Ghana. You know what I mean? I, I would love to see, you know, rites of passage right here in America. We used to do that. Yeah. I mean, so that's the one thing that is a goal of mine is to create these stations where we buy land and we, we have places where you can leave your environment, right? You go through like obstacle courses, you go through training, you go through the mental, the spiritual, the, the educational, whatever it may be for a certain amount of time, right? And then you can go back because people got it, like you said, they got to detox, leave the environment, then go back to it. Exposure, you know, is, is a different level of education, like and experiences, not sitting in the classroom, learning some curriculum that's about to be outdated, but like taking people to different environments and letting them develop in those environments, foster new ideas about life and their identity, right? So now you're creating more global citizens versus local ones. And this is why I say, you know, as long as we look at our reality based on all our problems, nothing will be solved, right? Because, and this is where I think of the future, you ask the average person, do you have anxiety towards the future or hopefulness? Most people go say either both or anxiety, right? L small percentage of people will go say that I really think hopeful to the future. And that's because we deal with a reality of future shock. Future shock is when things are shift so much, you get disorientation or you get anxiety because things are changing so much you can't process it. And we live in fast consumption society right now where we're constantly getting new technology, we're getting new news, new things happening, whether it's an alien invasion or whether it's AI, but you're not really consuming the data and the information to process the moment to even get the true value out of it, right? What's the true value of this technology that you, the people have been given? Like, the world's been given artificial intelligence. Now, if you would break that down, that means that you got, you just got millions of dollars worth of a research assistant you know what I'm saying? Now you got somebody that can do your graphic design, somebody that can do your emailing for you, somebody that can do your editing. Like you've been given uh, essentially wealth. But if you don't know what to do with it, it's not worth nothing to you, right? And if you are in a situation where you can't think of the future and you're stuck in immediacy, your brain can't even wrap itself around to be calm enough to even be in a place for learning, right? So. Number one, for us, it's about who, who are the greatest influences of our culture, I mean, of our future. This is why having grand strategies is important than tactics, because most of the time we got tactics. We know something, we react to it, we react to it. Those tactics, you never win, right? You got to have a grand strategy if you go fight a war. And so, number one, thinking as a collective, saying that, all right, what do we want the future to be, right? Let's think about when they run simulations uh, 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 and figuring out, you know, uh, pandemics, they have to sit back before the pandemic happened and look at every aspect that it will affect and run a simulation based on what they think will happen. So by the time it happens, they're not getting no shock, they're prepared, right? In culture or in, in, in black society, we have to do the exact same thing, all right? What can be an issue that's is gonna come from this AI stuff? What can happen if we continue with this mental health decline? Right? What is going to happen if politics continue to go the way that it does? Right? What's going to happen is currency starts to change and new family dynamics start to play out. So you have to sit down in a round table and start to play out all of these different things and prepare for them. And then, OK, what can we put in place for the way we want things to go? The thing about the future is there's no truth about the future because the future it hasn't happened yet. There's only truth about the past. Right. But the future is up to the planners. The future is up to execution. Nobody owns the future. There's no certainty. But we don't sit down enough because we're always in survival mode. How do we get past this moment versus how do we control time? Right. Going forward. So from that's why I, I, for me, focusing on the media and education is huge because of programming. You talked about your child at the early ages, the stages of development when they don't have consciousness. They don't know a why. God is in a why. That's the understanding, right? Once you understand the why, you can move forward, right? You can have alignment. Anytime you talk to somebody, you don't understand. You're weary of them, right? They're weird to you. <laughs> That's why we call people weird. I don't understand you. But when you understand, oh, I get it. Whether you agree or not, you can now move forward because there's not a blockage there. And the rest of the world probably don't understand us because they don't have enough information on us. And a lot of us don't understand the rest of the world, the way systems work. You all understand the way systems work. So let's, let's picture the solutions real quick. Like, you've worked with everybody, right, that I can think of. There's too many people to name. Let's just say all the hip-hop. <laughs> 
and not even just hip hop, but that, that crosses over to all the other industries, politics. Everybody that's somebody that's been in this fight for social change, they gotta know Erica Ford, right? We we see you working with Jay Z and Meek Mills with the Reform Alliance, getting bail reform and getting things changed in the justice system. But I want to know two things from you all. If we talk at a high level, as far as based on all of what you know now, right? And we sitting at this round table and saying, what's the future of the most effective things that we can do to change Black society, right? Where do we start from there? Like, is it media? Is it education? You know, is it is it mental health? Is it like creating conflict resolution centers everywhere? Where do we start at a high level so that this conversation is not redundant and in the future we're past this and we're at a different point in time? So on, t on two levels, one, you know, how do you build a resilient city, right? And so I'm looking at my community, Southeast Queens, as is, it's a city, right? And so people need access to food. How do we get them access to food? People need access to quality education. How do we get them access to quality education? From the perspective of we can't talk about what the problem is, we have to feed the solution to the people, right? And then at the same time, organize them to be part of it. At the same time, create economic wealth. You talked about earn your leisure, right? How do you gain wealth for your community yourself? How do you, and, and you know, I heard that whole conversation is not wealth, it's y'all are, you know, we're gaining some money, but how do we break that, that barrier that keeps us at a lower level. And, and we gotta buy land, right? And then when we buy land, then we can, can take, not only create our own community, because some people can't live in certain places, right? You might have to send, spend time out, right? But spend it drinking wheatgrass and green juice and waking up with Queen of Four and doing workouts or Eric Thomas, you know, really that motivation stuff and learning discipline and up with our own army, right? Um, with the brothers from the nation and learning how to have discipline and stuff. And so let's retrain and recreate the mind of our people so that at, between three and five, right? One, you're raising your kid different. And then one, we're starting from the bottom to the top, right? And, and, and creating, like there's something, and, and we want to do some environmental stuff that can bend and, and global stuff that can begin to reconnect us to the world and change how we relate to the world. And if we do it on, then at the same time, there has to be those brothers and sisters who are talking about changing the system that continues. Because the system is what is the problem, mm -hmm. right? And, and we can continue to act like there's these different things that are gonna make a difference. And they might for a time, you know, but I'm 58, I started at 22, right? And so, am I, you know, there's always that question, are we different from the 60s and the 70s? Or are we still in the same place as some people got a little bit of money? But there was whole communities that had monies back then, right? There was the, the nation within the nation in the Black Belt South. Mm -hmm. And they had to destroy the, the concept and the people, right? They always talked about, with counterintelligence program, destroying that idea of a leader, right? And so to your concept of everybody being a leader, you can't kill everybody. Mm -hmm. Right, and so you put the idea and the spirit inside the people, and all of that has to happen at the same time. And so you make the movement fun and resourceful, so that you're not like me or Jay talking about, you know, like I'm. I'm. I've started an organization in 2002. It transcended from the organization that I started with Tupac and, and Matulu, the Code Foundation. It started from before that when I joined the December 12th movement. Right, but there was continual elevation. And now I'm passing the baton, right? I can no longer you know, run a day-to-day -day operation, but you have to be constantly giving birth to new people, right? You have to be constantly nurturing the folks, not competing with the folks underneath, <laughs> coming up under you, but giving them the jewels. And so, you know, it's teaching. It's, it's for me, it's teaching what I've learned and training young people how to do this the right way because with social media, we've learned to be impatient We've learned to just quick fix, quick rewards, the, the fame and the glory and not the grind and the hard work that's really going to make the fundamental change. And so that's what I see as, as a resolution. And, and it, it is by doing partnerships, right, with, with organizations and entities who have access to a certain element of people and an organization like Life Camp who 
needs to be uplifted. Our voice needs to be heard, you know, and, and, and just like Brother Jay. And so, you know, we got to make some real concrete change, small places and allow it to grow. What brings you the most frustration when you think about this work? Niggas. Mm. <laughs> um, backstabbing niggas. Excuse my French. And what do I mean? As a black woman, I've been attacked, blackballed, lied upon by my own people, people who stand right next to me, people who stand close to me. You know, I know one individual, you know, they, they, they told the whole community stuff about me. And then it was like, oh, it's not true? I'm sorry. You already told the whole community this lie for years. Right? And, and, and people are so oppressed and so traumatized, we believe stuff that we don't, we don't look for facts, we don't research, you know? And so it is the, the relationship to people who are in this, this, this movement that has been my biggest challenge, and mostly men, you know? Because if I was a man, I would be at a whole nother level, you know? And I'm constantly attacked and quietly or loud, you know, and, and they know who they are and I know who they are. And what I've decided to do is just like keep distance. Like I, I would always be the one who brings everybody. I, I'm a connector. I've connected people. I've helped people to elevate, you know, and we have a system and the system is, is people coming together. So when we talk about Supreme, it's a street element, right? I wasn't a street element. We had Chaz who worked with gangs, right? We had another sister, Terry Williams and Kepper Cares who did the mental health and the wellness, right? We brought bartenders who does physical fitness. I bring everybody together. I bring the artists. When you talk about Fat Joe and Salt and Pepper and Angie Martinez, we do the shows with Hot 97. Like we bring everybody together to create a different environment and break that cultural poison that is feeding into our children's mind. I'm never about me as an individual. Um, and sometimes the camera will come to me because they see the work, they don't know you, right? And so they're not gonna ask you for an interview. It's not, and that's not a fault of mine, but when I talk, I'm gonna talk about all of us because we all are grinding together. And that's somebody's job, like, when, when, you know, to do the advocacy. Like, Greg Jackson, with Community Justice Action, right now for us in the Black and Brown Peace Coalition, that's his job, right? And so, of course, he's gonna be in front of the camera the most, and we gotta be comfortable with that, right? Because if we're looking, what happens now is people wanna be that person in front of the camera, so they're gonna try to come around and do whatever they can to get in front of that camera, and not even knowing what the hell they're gonna say when they get in front of the camera, or what it's gonna do to them once they get in front of the camera. Cause it ain't for everybody, right? Because they, they de dehumanize and malign and attack and criminalize people who they feel is going to influence. They used to walk around with a picture of me, the police, in their little black book and say, get her first. Cause if you get her, then you know, the rest will fall down. Cause she's gonna be the one to influence. They used to call me the skunk cause I had a gray streak going down my, my, my hair, right? But they intentionally were targeting me, and for a reason, right? Because I wasn't back, I didn't fight niggas, I didn't fight each other, right? I'm fi I know who my enemy is, right? And so, and now we stand in the, in the middle, so we don't allow the police to, to come to the community, right? We, I got a chief of streets, and so you wanna speak to the chief of streets, you wanna speak to me, you're not gonna speak to Pookie or his moms or whatever, right? Because we are gonna get them a lawyer as soon as they get arrested. Anybody in the hood. With that, give me a structure real quick. So like, 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 let's say if this was a model for all different hoods, you know what I mean? The chief of streets, somebody you go through, like what's a structure that somebody that wants to get into this, wants to transform a community, but they don't really know how to get started? It's, I would say, <clears throat> so I have a chief of streets, I have a chief of wellness operator, um, I have marketing experts, I have people who work with politicians, I have people who work with um, special ops team that work with the brothers and sisters underneath the ground, right? Um, I have women who work with the mothers because we want to create that ecosystem because like you talked about before, it's buying time. So 
I know you two got beef. I know you just some, killed somebody in his crew, right? So I know he gonna wanna come back to you. Mm -hmm. So I might go to his girlfriend and be like, yo, here's $500, take him away. And of course, that's no money. Take him away to the hotel for the weekend. Keep him active, Yeah. right? You buying time, right? So now he can't mobilize to shoot you. So you know you got a couple of hours or a couple of days, get you out of here, right? And, and I'm not saying that we work with somebody we know intentionally, but we work with individuals who have the highest risk. Mm -hmm. And so if you're constantly mediating, and those, there's hours that go into an individual, right? Because if you, for 20, 30 years, have been living this lifestyle, for me to get you to change your mindset, it's not going to be five hours and a fish dinner and one rally, right? It's going to take a lot. And, and so I'm going to need your whole family, everybody. I might... Put a, say, police, sit in front of the girlfriend's house. And I might tell him, yo, the police is looking for you. They got a police car in front of your girlfriend's house. And then he'll call his girlfriend, like, is there a police car out there? She'll say, yeah. Now, they ain't out there looking for him, but he don't know that. She don't know that. And you bought more time. Mm. Right? You bought time. Yo, the streets is hot. Cool that off. You got to use all tactics. Right? And so that's, that's knowing your personnel. That's knowing the streets. That's knowing... You, and so when we talk about these OGs, right, you know, yeah. I can't send Johnny to Square yeah, no. to talk this guy off this ledge yeah. with this gun. Well. I got to send the OG, whether he, you know, and of course, the objective is to get you out the game. Yeah. But that's why we created a business out of it. So now we're going to pay you to get out the game. And then so, and your point, too, is you could be credible but not suitable, right? And so we, we got to work with you. The, the OG, the credible messenger, at the same time we working with that high-risk individual because you got stuff that might trigger you to go back into the streets, right? And so it's, it's a lot of work. Mm -hmm. And they think you could just do it like this. They think that there's no science to it. They want to look at all of us as perps, you know, but we have a structure. You could go to lifecampinc.com. We also just partnered with the Chicago Crime Lab. We're starting actually September 11th. We're starting our first cohort in our leadership training academy. So there's a, a school that we're developing that can actually train uh, individuals like this. And me and Jay gonna be doing some stuff, training folks, you know. <laughs> um, and and so you could come out, reach out to us, um, because there's a lot. There's there's also the work with the parents who've lost their children, right? Because they become a lot happens to them, right? A lot happens to that family. They. A lot of them end up in divorce. So I, the, the, one of the mothers who work with me, she picked up the gun and started shooting back at the person that shot at her son, mm -hmm. right? And she would, ended up in jail. And then I saw I'm like, yo, come work with us. Right, because she, I knew she was gonna end up either dead or killing somebody, right? And, and she came to work with us and, you know, ended up changing her whole life. And now she has an organization called Where Do You Go From Here? But it was a process to get her there. Yeah. It was a process both on her side and my side. Like, she, she gave me hell. Hell. But I never gave up. Right? And, and the young people, too, they cursed me out. Their parents cursed me out. The staff cursed me out. Right? And so when you look at all of this, my colleagues talk about me and curse me out behind my back. The politicians curse me out. This ain't an easy job. The police is definitely cursing me out. Right? And so, but... But, you know, you talked about the, what keeps me going, and it's going to be 36 years on December 12th this year, it's, it's the love of the people. You know, it's that undying love of the people that keeps me going. Um, and and I, I, I'm going to be going until my dying days, and I'm living to 150, so I'll be here for a while. <laughs> So that, that, that's beautiful, number one. Um, conflict resolution is a huge issue. You know, um, a lot of people, because what I heard especially is the time issue. We get very reactive. As soon as something happens, the immediacy of we're not having a pathway to deal with things, and we just triggered, and all we see is red, and we got to go do something now. So even giving that time to where you're forcing a person to even think about their decisions is key. Right, so it's like in every neighborhood, the same issues exist. It's the same exact issues all over, right? Nobody's hood is unique, right? So for me, 
when we talk about crime deterrent, you talk about crime prevention, right? If if you really uh, believe that the people that are in power have your interests at best heart, then they will be setting up programs similar to the one that you have. Every single neighborhood that are high crime areas need this, right? They need community liaisons. They need, you know, intervention uh, uh, programs so that you're not just watching and waiting for crime to happen, right? Investigating somebody, you're deterring it so it doesn't happen so they don't go down that path. Because I don't know how we got ourselves to this mindset, we watch it on TV all the time, where they watch people until they commit a crime yeah. so that they can place them in the prison system versus, listen, we watching you, don't do that. You know what I mean? Because if you do it, we definitely go lock you up. They're not trying to prevent it. Right. So that has to be the people's job because that's not their layer of, of, of job. That's our job to say that our job is prevention. How do we stop the crime from happening? How do we stop the, that boy from committing that murder and throwing his life away? You know what I'm saying? How do we get them to get a quick second to think that cop from shooting that kid? So all of these are issues in a bucket and there are solutions around it to solve. We got to start creating these degrees of separation before it crosses over and occurs, because like you said, when you live in an over-policed environment, it's automatically going to be more crimes. Just simply at the fact that more crimes are being caught, right? It's not that crimes are not happening in other places, but less people are getting caught and getting thrown in jail. They're getting second, third, and fourth chances before these issues arrive. Judges are saying, man, this is a nice kid. I don't want to see him in jail. We're going to give him another chance, right? We don't get also, that stop in our first, environment. They were just stopping people, right? If yeah. you stop everybody in the neighborhood, you're going to, and you arrest half of them, mm -hmm. Right now they have a record. Now they lost their job. Now they are traumatized. Now they hate police. They going home. They mad. They're not going to fight that police. They're going to beat their kid or beat their wife because they're still mad from the encounter that they had with the police. And there was 75,000 black men who were stopped and frisked and thrown on the ground and searched for no reason. Mm -hmm. Right? And so, and then when you talk about marijuana, now it's legal. Okay, you could go home. No, you fucked up my whole life. Yeah. Reparations. Right. And then when you say you are giving the card license holders retail license to these brothers so that they can open up their own and make money, now here come these big white companies saying, oh, no, we want to go first. And every a law is a law until it ain't beneficial to them. And then it ain't the law no more. Right? And, and how did all of y'all become professionals at this when it was illegal? Because they all the lawyers, the accountants, the farmers, the, the, the retail, like they are the experts. How and when did you become an expert when this was illegal, right? You knew what you was doing, right? And so that's why we have to challenge everything. We can't just take, like I tell my staff, they tell you no, you tell them why. No, I'm not accepting no. Don't accept, I don't accept anything that these people say. Anything. I've never been, I was always in trouble in school. Because I, I buck authority, right? I don't know why, but I buck authority. Because you're telling me something because you want to. It's not because, like, what does this have to do with anything? You got a gun on your hip and a, a badge that says you could come over here and tell me something. But why are you here anyway? Mm. Right? And then you see me talking like this, you're like, oh, she's getting violent. Arrest her. Right? I didn't commit a crime, but now I'm mad. Right? And so if you keep doing this every day to a community, what do you think you're going to get? Mm. Crime. It's like you keep telling your, your partner, you cheating. I'm not seeing you with the, you cheating, you cheat. They're going to be like, I might as well cheat. Because well you harassing me to, like every day saying I'm cheating. Right? And so these are just mindsets that we got to break. We got to challenge. We have to confront. We got to organize. We got to protect our community. And, and not allow, like, we got to have barriers. Just keep pushing the barrier to, like, no, we don't need police here. We got this. We got this. Yeah, so there's, um, so I just left last Friday the largest public safety policy organization in the country. I was the CEO, running about, you know, 20 to $30 million organization, 100 staff. This year, we would have passed, we would have won 100 campaigns. Um, you know, um, our, our work spans across the top eight incarcerated states in America. Um, we've been able to move $3 billion from, you know, ta of tax dollars from this 
you know, crime response system into front end solutions, straight to community like violence prevention, mental health, substance abuse, education, workforce development, like funding programs. Um, you know, our work spans, you know, freeing about 10 million people with criminal records, expunging their records, um, working with Desmond Mead down in Florida to pass Amendment right. 4. You know, 1.6 million people now have their, you know, a, a, a pathway to register to vote, but Florida's, you know, there's still work that needs to be done there. Um, we support victims of crime. Um, we had one of the two largest constituencies of victims of crime, 300,000 members vic uh, who identify as victims of crime, 300,000 members who identify people with records. Um, and I stepped down. So I've grown, I did eight years in prison, and I, I did my time, you know what I mean? I, I, you know, that's all I'll say. I, I did my shit, you know? 10 years being out, I hopped right into it. I didn't, you know, go and do something else. I hopped right into it from, from North Stockton, got right to work. Ask anybody about Jay Jordan from North Stockton, they tell you that nigga do work, you know? working with kids, cleaning up my city, started a whole thing called Clean Up Stockton, mobilizing hundreds of people to scrape gum off the streets and paint over graffiti. I was really doing community building work, you know, the whole like built environment, trying to change that. So I got right into the work, got into policy work, campaigns. I'm good at what I do. But I realized something about what it does to the individual, right? I've grown so big professionally. All that invest fest and people were stopping me, calling me time done. <laughs> and I'm like, nah, my name is Jay Jordan, bro. You know what I mean? I'm Jay Jordan. You know what I mean? Like, and I, you know, it wasn't just like just the, the professional growth. It was the, it was the shrinking of the personal. Like you lose your identity in this. You just so focused on fixing the world that you don't realize you're breaking yourself. You know what I mean? And there's a lot of people out there that is working in this movement for justice, for equality, to end racism, for gender equality, for environmental justice, for years and years and years, for a spiritual revolution. I mean, people in churches, pastors, everybody, folks been doing this work for a long time and you lose yourself. You will lose your square and you're like, who am I? It got so deep that my wife and my kids woke me up on March 13th of 2023 and told me happy birthday and I didn't even realize it was my birthday. I fought to free myself because I, 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 I had a felony in California five years ago. There were eight million people in California with criminal records. There was no pathway for us to expunge our record. Me and about 10 others got to work. We all had records. We got to work. My organization sponsored it, allowed us to spend money and do concerts and build huge walls and you know take 500 families up to the state capitol and lobby. And we did a lot of work. And it took us five years and three laws but we got every single person free in California. Not everybody in California has a pathway to expunge their record. The only people who don't is people with sex offenses, but everybody else, you can go file for an expungement, right? And I got free. And the one thing that I always said was, I, I have two sons and I can't coach their little league team when they get into sports. I can't volunteer at their school. I can't chaperone field trips. I went to the court and expunged my own record. I, and when, they, and when the teacher sent me a letter saying Lil J has a, has a field trip, I told my wife, oh, I can't go. I got work. The very thing I was fighting for, I couldn't even enjoy. And she was like, nah, you going. <laughs> Fuck work, you going. I found myself drinking more. I found myself in the gym trying to lift 500 pounds. You know what I mean? What am I doing trying to bench, <laughs> bench press 500 pounds? I got to 405, you know what I mean? I'm like, what am I doing? I looked at my text messages, and I was trying to find a text between me and my brother, and I had to scroll like two or three times. All the text messages was from colleagues and people in the work. Like, what am I doing? Yeah, you know, Alliance for Safety and Justice is the tip of the spear when it comes to public safety policy, the premier organization, hands down, right? Like, nobody can hold accountable to them when, in terms of passing laws in tough states. That's what we do. We're good at it. Um, fringe benefits, like I, I had benefits, healthcare, dental, none of that compares to the weight of losing yourself and your family suffering, right? I was out there front line going to, you know, Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, um, Detroit, Michigan, you know, Austin, Texas, doing these large scale events, you know, um, helping people with records. And I still do it. My DMs are flooded with people with records asking for expungement help. I can operate optimally 
200% professionally, but I'm spending that currency, my time, doing that. And that work-life balance is real. And while I don't feel I'm burned out, my family's burnt out. I can keep going, my family's burnt out. And now my health, I'm starting to feel it. You know what I mean? I lost weight, you know, and, and, I, and, and my mental, like I can work till two, three in the morning and then go to sleep for two hours and get up and do it. My wife is like, what are you doing? What are you doing? And so I stepped down and, and as I realized it, it, during this transition, um, I realized that poor people can't win wars, but they can build community. You can't win a war, communities can't win a war if you're poor, but they can build community. And I realized we have to fight different. We were successful and will continue to be successful as that organization because we were well-funded. But there are organizations right now that are doing tremendous work and having tremendous impact but are not funded at the level that, that they should be funded, right? There are, and shout out to Lenore Anderson and her work with Scaling Safety, I think it's some of the most amazing work that's gonna come down the pipeline. Um, scaling Safety is all about identifying safety deserts in America. What does that mean? So you, you know how you have food deserts? Yeah. Where the lack of good food, like form to fork, no, there's know, yeah, there, you, there's safety you. deserts yeah, no, where no. you have more liquor stores and more extractive industries like buy here, pay here, not only car lots now, but furniture stores and everything else you can think of, bail bonds, you have pawn shops, then you have you have all of that stuff. And you don't have early childhood development, you don't have child care, so uh, parents can go to work and not worry about paying two, three, four thousand dollars. Just the same old pressure that we talked care. about it intentional, and then somebody comes along and says that that's they make a name for it, and then now they're wonderful. No, I don't agree with that. Yeah. But um, the issue is definitely important to deal with. See, because what happens is now we're starting to fund fund so that we can do research about where these things exist. And et cetera, et cetera. And I'm, I'm just talking from emotion and, and, and thing, not from, because I don't know anything about it. But what tends to happen to us as a people is we create these things that allow somebody to do research and build around this concept. We could just deal with oppression because every black community is all of those things. No, and no. some. Yeah, so say, so. Th this is not a, a research project. This is like actual funding communities to fill those gaps. So like when I say safety deserts, it's just like giving a contextual, like, you know, semantics to it so people can understand what I'm talking about, right? There are communities in America right now that don't have what they need and so they're unsafe, right? So you have all these extractive communities, you have fast food joints, you got you know, stores, like 99 cent, cent stores, big box stores. It's a black community and everywhere. It's not, and it's not just black communities, Latino though. It's community. Latinos communities. It's poor white communities. Yes. It's indigenous but it's, communities. But it's right? mostly black communities and Latino it, communities. It's black and brown communities and communities that, are, that have an aggregate amount of people living at or below the poverty. Correct. And those are mainly urban centers. But what we realized in our research, I did the research. research. I, I, I knew there was some I did, research. I, I did the research. You got to research and know we the get data. A, we could have saved you. And what I realized is there we are. We could have saved you the money. Well, hold on, because <laughs> this was different. I'm going to tell you something you don't know. Where do you think most people with records live at? Which, which where are they? With criminal records. In, where, where in they Wyoming live? or in New York? In everywhere, just like period. They live in five zip codes in New York. Most of the people with records. In America, there's well, 100 million people. There's and, different and, places. And where those 100 live. million people live in, in rural areas. Right. Rural areas. I thought they lived in urban centers. I was like, oh, well, it's inner cities. There are people with criminal records everywhere. There, there, are, there, are, there are folks that don't have what they need everywhere. And when I learned around, like, not, not just in the coastal areas, right? So, like, not in New York, in L.A., in Oakland, where we think every, all the black folks live. Black folks are... Are spread out now. Correct. Right? And so how do you get to the black folks that aren't in, you know, those five boroughs, aren't, aren't in Miami, Dade, aren't in these neighborhoods that are living right. in places in Jersey but are still experiencing economic dep deprivation? Anywhere black folks live. That's what I said. Exactly. So it's like how do you how do you how do you address that? And so you gotta address oppression. 
You got to address the oppression, but you also... Because okay. they created these communities. I these get, communities don't exist by accident, yeah, I, which is everything we just finished saying. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Right? Yeah, and so, I, I, I but I want to stay on, on the point that, like, we, these things don't exist by accident, right? And when we talk about who we're voting for or, you know, where we're spending our money or where we're putting our... So one of the things that we used to organize was general strikes, right? It's Black Solidarity Day is a thing, right? It's before Election Day. And on Black Solidarity they did a play about the day of absence. And what would happen if black folks didn't participate in society today, right? There's no work, there's no school, there's no shopping, right? And, if, and the more we did general strikes, the more they came more aggressive at the, the work that people did, even in the, in the 60s, right? When they did strikes, that's when they came with the aggression. Because when we take out our dollar from this system, when we stop this system from running and its ability to continue building wealth off of us, then we shake things up and we're able to have a conversation about, no, we can't go back like this, right? But how many of us, they have conditioned us, we won't even stop using the internet for a day, right? And so how do we, and this is like the codes for the new generation, right? How do we re-educate and build a line between what used to exist and worked, that they're trying to make us look at like it's old and it won't work for us no more, and what young people or, or new generation need to look at and how we really shake up society? Because I truly believe that, I mean, there's this too, there's, there's like reward work, right? when you talk about these different programs that I run and everybody else, there's limited success that we can all have because we don't have the resources to really reach all of those people around the world, right? But we can verbally reach people all around and say, on November 4th, on this day, none of us are going to go to work. That's community. So that's community building. And, what, and my point I'm, I was trying to make yes. <laughs> is, my good sister, is that we got to fight different. And like always operating from a deficit frame and depending on, you know, certain individuals to fund the work yeah. will always hinder our ability to scale, mm -hmm. right? So I'm like, how do, how do we scale what works, right? And how do we scale what works isn't the way we, we're operating now. Right, I never right? worked at one of those big corporations, right. so I never had that luxury. Exactly, so I, I, I understand I understand what like what scaling looks like. We started out with like 12 employees. Right. You dig what I'm saying? But it was easy for y'all to get money because of who you're affiliated with. It was easy for us to get money because we were founded by philanthropy for right. sure, right? And and that's what I'm saying. So when, when the beginning of it is economics and not deficit, it changes things. Of you dig what I'm saying? So if you start from and say, and hey, let's stayed, build a business. We stay together. Right? Let's build a business. And then that business then funds the work and fills those gaps. That changes everything. Without a doubt. Right? And so for me, that's why I'm like, well, wait a minute. Let me take my skill set and what I learned that it starts from you, you got to have money to fight the war. It's the reason why America spent, though, what do you say, $320 trillion? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All that money to Ukraine, Right? Because we, Ukraine would have been losing if they ain't had the money. And we have consistently been in this loop because we're focused on getting the money from the same system. Yes. Government con contracts. Yeah. Philan philan philanthropy. And, we're, and they need the problem to exist. Yeah. Government needs this problem to exist. So we're asking, like in California, all of the reentry, most of the reentry programs, you know where they get their money from? From probation. Right. <laughs> So it's like you get money from the very people that you're saying doesn't need to exist. Right. And so m m where I'm like, yo, how do we move forward is we have to look at how we structure the thing or the institutions or the organization that we're building. And it has to start from like being vertically integrated and self-sustained from, you know, the funding source. Yes. Right. So not to cut your wisdom. So for me. Listening to both of y'all, because like you said, he's, he's more, has more of a corporate side of fighting the battle, right? And you have more of a community organizer side of fighting the battle. If you look at the way other people fight their battles, 
whether it's the ADL, whether it's the LGBT, whether it's the ESG, right? They create codes, right? And anybody that goes against that, then yes, they have economic or political sanctions put against them, right? So ESG, environmental safety governance, if it's things that's not good for the environment, right, then they tell investors don't put any money with that or they tell people don't do any partnerships with you, right? You don't get labeled as a good company, right? So if there's a framework, because what works better is when we got documents and frameworks and codes, these actually last over time. Whether they're being broken down now, right, that doesn't matter, but they last for a very long time. So if all the organizations agree to a framework to say, okay, listen, this is an organization who puts a certain amount of percentage back into a community or back into situations like what you all are talking about. And, you know, this particular uh, uh, restaurant that's in the hood, we labeled these to be compliant, right, to everybody that comes in agreement to say they are up to code on things that we can support or they can be in our environment at all or things that we can invest in. Because what we have as our greatest tool is our spending power. Right. That 45 million that equal that 1.7 trillion. That's our power. Right. And if who, whoever has influence over that power has the power. Right. So you come in with the influence and where the media comes in and the talking point is, hey, listen. The NFL, the larger, largest viewership, more large viewership is black people. Right. Or the NBA. Then we say that unless the NBA gives a certain amount of money to this pact. Uh, unless the, the NBA does this, that, or the third, or they have these particular tenants, then we can guarantee that viewership will be decreased, right, over the year, right? Unless this company is compliant with these codes, not just ESG and things of that nature, but it has to be compliant with what we think are interests of, you know, these movements. Because everybody, every one of these organizations, none of them matter unless they all come together to an agreement. Right. Unless they can all agree on these rules and then they can all take that same rule and stamp it over everybody and hold it against them. Because there's no separate different LGBT departments that don't all agree on the overarching agenda. They might not. And when they do disagree, you never hear about it in public. And they have many disagreements on ways to go about it on multitude of different things. But you never, ever hear about it in public because they understand that at a high level, they have to be in agreement publicly. And that if people don't follow, you know, the, 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 the program, then that's when they put the sanctions on them. So whether it's your organization, your organization, whether it's all the other ones that we know about, everybody has to sit down and be like, all right, listen, for every single corporation, for every media, for every whatever it is, if they don't follow this, then we're not making it a personal thing to point out one by one. We're just saying that we're not supporting none of y'all until you you are in compliance with these new codes that we now have. And then that changes from a systematic level, right? Because now the employees of that business, that'll be black or brown or whoever falls into, they feel like it benefits them the same way the SAG strike is going on. They're going to all be like, no, I'm not doing my work. And that's the editor in the room. That's the person that's the manager. That's the person that's working up front. That's how the LGBT work. The Jewish people, they have an issue with... Um, the ADL is having a fight right now with Elon Musk. Elon Musk is saying that they're destroying our ad revenue by going to these ad uh, places and telling them they can't spend money with us because we're anti-Semitic. Because they have a code that says that if literally listening to the, uh, the, 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 the government puts out this and says that this is what ADL means and this is what anti-Semitism means. And if you fall into any category of this, there's sanctions against you. So where is it in society where black people say, listen, boom, here's our code. If you don't follow into this, then we put sanctions. It's nothing personal. It's just that everybody is going to act and every organization is in agreement with this. There's no Jewish organization that's arguing against the, the ADL and their actions that they take to combat anti-Semitism. Right. So when we talk about anti-black behavior. Right. And, and things that coincide with our movements, it has to be a vast agreement. There is no other way. Right. And if there is no agreement, then we are fighting different sides. You know what I mean? But nobody is actually creating something that's systematic that changes it. So for me, it's about every organization coming onto the same page because one may be funded, one may not be funded. But as long as you all have one singular agenda that they are all agree on, you're going to be way more powerful because y'all can call each other and be like, listen, you know, uh, 
whatever company, Coca-Cola don't want to agree to this. You know what I mean? So boom, you know what we got to do next. All right, now every organization got to go into action. We don't want to, but we got to. And anybody that is in alliance, because when you make those alliances, you say, listen, sorry, we can't support it because they're not in alliance with our anti-black agenda, right? Nobody else has to complain and fight this hard when they make legislation for it. You know what I mean? And they put a code down and they be like, all right, now the army stands behind this. And anybody that don't stand on code, right now, you get sanctioned as well. See, the, the key point, you said economics and army, right? You got the power to control the economics and you got the power, the military, to enforce, to enforce it, right? And so when you look at, at, at our organ movement, right, whether whatever issue it is, um, we, we get into conflict because everybody wants to be the leader or not listen to the leader, right? Or not define a leader or, you know, and, and, and a lot of it is organized by someone else, right? Or they put a, 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 a person in your organization that is a part of the counterintelligence program to disrupt, disorganize, and, and take people off of target, which is, happens a lot, right? Or to criminalize your work, right? And then you spend time fighting against that and fighting against different charges or whatever, and this person was planted into your organization. So there's many different things that stops our process from doing that, right? It's because there's not someone intentionally trying to stop them, right? And so we can't, once again, forget about that part of the thing because in our, the Black Panther Party, right, they killed them off. They literally, they, it existed, right? They had the Black Panther Party. They had SNCC. Um, and, and they had to kill, they killed people. They terrorized the movement, so they made it, you scared to join it. And then they made people celebrities in the 20s, into 2020, yeah. right? So then- the, the bigger thing with that is, and this is one thing that they can't discount, is the way the youth move today. The youth don't have a belief in the system. The youth don't believe in none of the old regime and the old ways whatsoever. So the revolutionizing of the youth to believe in these ideas and these codes is what they're going to follow. And they're going to follow them, like they're going to walk off their job, right? No matter what they're, they're in the military, whether whatever position they're in, they're going to be like, this is what we agree on. They're fighting for goddamn climate control, you know, harder than they fight for anything today. Why? Because somebody got them to believe in it, right? And so it's like, it's never, we never was presented with the code to say that, okay, this is the standard that all businesses and politicians and movements and everybody should follow. Because then when you have that public conversation, it's very easy for like an LGBT person to be like, okay, well, you don't believe in gay people have rights or humans? So now they're having this open conversation and that person's not going to vehemently say no, right? Back in the day they would have, Biden on Obama was against it at first. But when they put the money behind it, Right, they put the packs behind it, and they put that political push behind it. Don't matter what your beliefs were at first; you have to coincide with this because now you work for us, right? We never put together, you know, political action committees. We have to try the things that we haven't tried before, right? We can't if when something is lost, yeah. you got to look where you ain't looked before. Yeah. So the like in this movement, I want to like so you have movements in, inside movements, right? So you have the larger movement, and there are some people who are like. I'm with the black empowerment movement, and then I'm also working on criminal justice reform from a black, through a black lens, or environmental justice through a black lens, or the gender justice through a black lens. You got those folks. Then you got folks who are like, I'm just criminal justice. I don't do anything else. And so it's hard to like quantify the movement, right? So it's like, you know. That's where the, the, the larger is not the specifics. It's, no, the human rights, it's the, the gender movement. Now, you can take your branch of it because you may care about women more than men. That's not my problem, but here's the rules for the overall movement. So this is, a, when you say overall movement, are you saying black people are like issues? Issues. So when you okay, when issues, you fought issues. for Bill, that wasn't just a thing that benefited not black I, people. Yeah, I never fought for Bill. Or, or I'm talking about, I mean, expungement, the uh, expungement. expungement. Yeah. For, uh, LSD. that was... <laughs> <laughs> It'll put me, put me in that fight, brother. <laughs> I don't know the politics. <laughs> Well, when you fought for the expungement, that wasn't, it, it directly benefited and you spoke on it from a lens of black people, but every white and Latino and Jewish or gay person, everybody benefited from it, yeah, and, right? And, and that's what I meant that. for when you change it from cultural to societal, you get things done faster. Yeah, and so the, 
the CJ reform movement, criminal justice reform movement is, is, is well, like it, it was well funded relatively new, right? There's a lot of investors that decided that mass incarceration is bad. It's bad for business. It's bad for, it, 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 it's everything. Everyone agrees on that. Both Democrats, Republicans agree on mass incarceration is bad. Now, how do you, you know, decarcerate, whatever, it's different tax, a different tactic, but there's money behind that. And then there are organizations working on different things within that, bail reform. There's organizations that work on bail reform. There's organizations that are funded to work just on expungement. There's organizations that work on free trial, whatever it is, right? And But there is no collective North Star in criminal justice reform. There is issues within that one issue, right, of criminal justice reform. And so my take, because, I again, I worked for an organization that was, like, you know, us in reform was probably the most well-funded organization in the country besides Vera and the rest of these research organizations. Um, right. When you are independent, you can do and say whatever the fuck you want to say. When you're not independent and you're funded by philanthropic organizations and entities that have donors and boards that they answer to, right, then you can't say whatever you want to say, Unless right? You're Unless you're Erica Ford, right? And so, like, and so there are there are people that are funded and their funders. It's just like politics, right? I I worked in I worked on cam, cam, campaigns. The first thing you do is you go after their donors and say, hey, you going you gonna fund this and defund their campaign. And then and so like what, what I'm saying is, a strategy moving forward is each organization. What Erica's doing, what a lot of other organizations like Homeboy Industries, uh, Dorsey Nunn is doing in Oakland. You know, he owns a whole building. You know, um, uh, uh, um. What's the name? Ella Baker Center. Um, what George Galvez is doing, right? They are buying. They're buying buildings and businesses, and they fund the movement. Now they can do whatever they want to do and do the community building aspect. That's not funded because all the stuff we're saying, which is ensuring that every black person has what they need to be whole, every black family has what they need to be whole. Because I believe the only way that we get to where we need to get to is to build a database, and not COINTEL Pro database, but a database have centers in all these different communities. And then do case management of black families. Oh, knock on your door. What do you need? We got you. Go holler at so and so and so and so. That's the only way we level up. Like if you look at other communities, they do case management. And that is the nature of the New York City crisis management system, if ran correctly. Um, that is exactly what it's supposed to do, um, and and that's why we have so much success. But how do we scale that at a real level and have it in the control of the people, right? Because like you said, if the city's funding, they fund you. They tell you and give you a certain amount of money, but then, then you don't get the money until, you know, way after because it's reimbursement and, and everything is like, you know, you got to, like, I need the money, I need the money, I need the money. And then when you get the money, it's like you're so stressed from trying to get the money. It's just like a process that just, it breeds a lot of, yeah. It's difficult. And, and to get, and let's be clear, the money you're getting is your money to begin with. It's your tax dollars, and so tax dollars should be reverted straight to organizations that are doing the work to ensure that the communities that are unsafe or have these, you know, issues and have these gaps, those gaps are filled. Because what you said, government is not going to do that work. They're not set up to do prevention work. They're set up to do crime response. They have $300 billion of our money that's set up to respond to crime. There's a little amount of budget, right, to, to fund organizations. These organizations, what I venture to say, if black entrepreneurs, black billionaires, Latino billionaires, entertainers, athletes with this money are like, hey, I have a vested interest in building like safe and, and well and equitable communities, then we should be buying businesses, buying franchise, hell, buy a fucking wing stop and allow these organizations to fund to to they're 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 general operating to be funded by a, like two two or three wing stops instead of giving me a three million dollar grant. Instead of giving Jay Jordan or Eric Ford a $3 million grant, fuck your grant, go buy me some franchises and allow me to scale these franchises and I don't need your money anymore. Right. You know what I mean? But it's not operating like that. Right. They, this, this financial independence for organizations that are doing the work, both frontline and large organizations that are passing state, multi-state policies are funded by people that have a vested interest in getting a North Star completed and it may not be the North Star that actually what we're talking about, right? And so it's difficult to have a collective vision because everybody's funding sources is different. And if your funding sources is different, you're always going to be beholden to the funding. Because if you ain't got no funding, you can't fight the war. If you can't fight the war, what is it? And if, if Jay is looking for the lens and Erica is looking for the lens, is that that's, you're the funder. And we you only fund in one group. <laughs> and so yeah. ha, never do we say, well, let's go together. 
it, it don't work right? like that. Most people aren't saying, let's go together. Right? They're like, how do I get rid of her or how do I get rid of him so I can get you and get you to fund me, right? And so we got to look at, you know, how do we put our work together? So if he's doing criminal justice, you doing basketball, you doing food, um, food to table, farm to farm, table, yeah, farm to food, work. right? If you're doing housing, like how do you bring all of that together to work in this area? And so people aren't coming at each other, but we're forming those coalitions and collaborating in particular areas and then doing the database and tracking and building that ecosystem. And, and it's independently against. funded and independently funded by a business that is like giving the money directly to general operating. Because listen, all the a lot of this government funding and 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 uh, um, fund, money you get from donors is earmarked and for a particular reason. You can't even spend it. Eric, I, I guarantee you got programmatic funding that you can't spend on salary. You have to spend it on this program. It's crazy. Yeah. And so we have to change the funding sources of the movement. This and the people telling you what to spend it on have no cultural attunement, have all. no understanding of what you need, at et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so you find yourself... And that's why I say to them, no, I'm not going to spend it on that. But there's not a lot of people like me who can understand you can do that, right? right? No, that makes sense. So uh, to me, it comes back down, I think, like what you said, you know, it has to be funded by sources, you know, uh, from the community. So, like, when you got your own business, you know, yes, you can fund your own thing and you're not going to pull your own funding. Yep. Right. And yeah, you go, exactly. You go exactly. To, and what you want to do is going to get funded. Yeah. Right. So this is why, you know, for me, you know, economics is very important. This is why entrepreneurship is very important, because when we own the businesses, we can always take a percentage of those profits and that revenue and we can fund solutions. Yeah. Right. And so there's there's layers and tiers to it to where, you know, number one, our image is, is important. I, I talk about this in media. There's billions and billions of dollars that goes into media, but there's crumbs that go into black media. And black businesses don't buy into black media. We spend Facebook ads and revenue. We watch black programs, but don't reach out to them and be like, all right, listen, I have a marketing budget. Can I advertise on your platform? That platform is able to grow, increase, create jobs, right? That changes local economies. But we don't think in that manner, so we don't circulate between each other first. And then people look at us like, well, shit, if y'all ain't supporting each other, y'all come to us and want us to support y'all. That does not make much sense. Every other community can at least say that they have that on us. Right, no matter what their problem is. They, hey, I'm a white person, I spend with white people. I'm a, but I want to go back. Tulsa, Oklahoma, right? They had to kill the narrative. Yeah. So that people will never do that again. So that's so, what we reinstated for this generation as yes, the template moving forward. Job and this is why I say it. the code got to be the code because part of the fight, part of the fight is just, you know, part of the, the, the movement because we may have an activist movement that marches in the street to get their attention, but we don't have many movements to get our attention. Right. And our attention got to be like, listen, the people is outside because they want all of the so-called leaders and the groups to have an agreement. We don't give a damn about your politics. We want to have an agreement. The people are mad. So when you rally the people right for the movement, not to get outside attention, but to get inside attention. Now you're forcing these people to say that they for the people to come to the table, satisfy these people then. Make an agreement right now in front of everybody that y'all will work together and within a few months y'all come out with the constitution for us, right, to where y'all can, y'all can agree upon your departments and how y'all go work so now we can hold you accountable, right? So I feel like without accountability, because this generation is allergic to accountability, right, allergic to accountability. We don't want to be accountable for nothing. We want to be shameless and judgment-free and do whatever we want to, but that comes from the devil, not God. God always want to hold you accountable for your action. He give you free will to do it, but he say, you ain't doing my will unless you're doing good will. Right? Devil say, do whatever you do will. Right? And this generation is whatever I will. Right? These programs are whatever I want to do. So it got to be like, no, nah, the transparency era, and I think this is where younger generations, you see them turning against a lot of the movements that are for the people. It's like, we don't trust y'all. Because why ain't y'all working together? Why ain't y'all figuring this out? We don't care about your individual agenda of you wanting to be a friend or this. No. Y'all, you say y'all for us, come together. So to me, that's the future of the movement is the accountability of all of these separate departments to come together under one code, 
right, in one system, regardless of what your ego is, because otherwise you're not working for us. You're working for the longevity of this organization, which may not be for the benefit, especially when you know that the funding comes in, but it doesn't change anything. Now it becomes like what they said is happening in L.A., where they don't really want to get rid of the homeless because people have these six-figure jobs to get rid of the homeless. So when you when your job is it, it, when you lose your job by doing your job, yeah. right? Then you're never going to do a good job. <laughs> yeah, and that's why. And that was one of the main reasons why I stepped down. I'm like, yo, I'm done. I did it. I organized I'm myself done. out of a job. Time done. I like I I did like I did it. I I brought in a bunch of formerly incarcerated people. You know what I mean? Gave them jobs. I was like, yo, y'all buy you a house. You're getting paid good money. You know, we're going to pass this law. We all can get free. And then we'll go. Right. You know what I mean? I didn't know in the process I was going to, like, deteriorate yeah. and shit. You know what I mean? No, but, but, like, that's the, that's the, that's the, that's the truth. And I, and, I true, and I truly believe that you're right, Keys. You know, I believe that the source, God, Allah, Buddha, wh wh whatever you want to call it, I, I call it the source, is putting people in places right now for a, a revolution and a, and a, and a, evolution of human consciousness that is not like anything we've seen before. And I know it's true because people are being uprooted from work that they've known and loved for years and years and years and are putting in place and around people at the same time and are like, you build relationship with this person. Like case in point, when I made the decision to leave and I was telling the person, I'm like, yo, I'm leaving. And here's what, you know, here's, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go and do some healing stuff. I don't know where, I don't know how. I'm going to heal my shit. I'm going to treat myself. I had a meeting set up at 2.30. I didn't realize it was on my calendar. And this dude was like, yo, I do healing. Right? And now we're in a whole process of, like, building some cool shit together. Like, we are being put in places. And if you are right now feeling like, you know, uncomfortable, that's because God is telling you, you don't need to be where you need to be at. You need to jump and you're going to land in a place to where this next evolution of human consciousness is going to take you. And I believe that this younger generation, starting from, you know, the, the wisdom of the elders, right, down to the folks who, of us who got the knowledge and the millennials who are like, I'm ready to go. And the younger generation who are like, yo, you know, I want to build community and lend, and lend my voice. Like, that's what is needed right now. And you I truly believe... Yo, and, and I truly believe that. And I truly believe that. I truly believe that now is the moment. And, you know, I've talked to so many people around the country that are like, Jay, like, I'm excited, but I'm scared at the same time. And I know when I'm excited and scared, it's some big shit going to happen. Because I'm excited because I know the big shit is happening. I'm scared because I ain't never done it before. You dig what I'm saying? And so, like, now is the moment. Now is the moment to do that thing, to start that podcast, to lead that organization, to start that organization to like get out that relationship if it don't serve serve you, to go into that relationship that you were scared to go into. Like now the time we're in this we're we're in that Kairos moment, that season. We're we're in that season, man. The last time I had a conversation like this was with Angie Martinez, right? And I was telling her about my my health, right? And I said I had to take a break right then because I had hit the wall. But I hit the wall because the most high was trying to keep giving me a message and I wasn't listening. <laughs> Right? And and I and he, you know, I lost hundred I lost sixty pounds. And then even when I came back, right, I yesterday I put a post up saying that I went to Apple and I told him my phone wasn't working and it said I expounded the, the, the storage. And he was like he called her like, Yo, Joe, come over here. I've never seen this in history. You've gone beyond one gigabyte. Like no one has ever done that. And he was like, What are you doing? And I was looking at myself, I'm like, what are you doing? Like, why you have more than two gigabytes of shit on your phone? Like, what are you doing? Right? And then right after I said that message, I fell down the stairs. Mm. Right? And so it is because... God telling you something. Sit your ass down God and is stop trying to tell us stuff. something. <laughs> like, you know, yeah. and what does it take for me to listen? That's the addiction. Mm. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. It's the addiction. Yeah. Right? I got to be in it. No, I don't. Right? I got to sit back. And, and allow the wisdom to be taught. Allow myself to get people to actually take care of me for a change, right? And, and, and as you make your transition, right, and as you continue to spark mind, 
right? It's it's our purpose that a lot that drives us to the to those next steps, right? I, I remember Tupac was like, yo, I'm driving this car, I'm driving it in the wall, I'm gonna drive it, you know, straight ahead. And unfortunately the car went into the wall. But we all know we drive in the car, yeah. right? And we all know we have that power. And at some point we have to see the power of community and of collectivity and really be selfless, really be eager. Because like even when you ask the question about what things to be the most, right? I said the people, right? But that's ego talking, right? That's emotions talking. Because if I really look at what things, it's, it's the fact that we're even in these conditions, mm. right? It's the racism that we still have to go through and sexism in this day and time. Because everything that happens to us is intentional, right? And, and so, you know, what they did to, to black men in terms of, of making them, quote, criminals. They weren't criminals. They weren't breaking a law. You came and put a law in our community and put drugs in our community and made them criminals, made them drug dealers, made them drug addicts, right? Made them rob and steal to get drugs, right? Made mothers unable to take care of their children. And so you took their children out their home and put them in these businesses that you set up to take care of children, right? So it's all intentional. And that's just a copy of what they did, slavery, right? And so the more our, our folks get knowledge, the more we're able to, to stand in our square from the space in which we come and really make spiritual change. Because the, really the only person we could change is ourselves, right? Yeah. right? I think the spiritual change is what's going to make the real change and the real impact. They're going to... The world's going to go through the spiritual dryness as it is. People are going to feel the pain from their disconnection, and it's going to make them want to, or to reconnect at a higher level. And that reconnection is going to create a completely new generation because they're now going to experience what it's like to be without God, you know what I mean, to rebel against that. And then they're going to want those values and those morals so much that when they get it, they're going to become addicted to that. And it's going to espouse this whole new culture around that. And you're going to see, for my belief, a youth starts to go in that direction just because they've done everything else. Right. And so now they have to go back to what's right, because that's the only thing that's going to be left in hip hop. Look at it going all the way from Doja Cat dressing up as a demon. Like You can't go no further than that. It's over. So what do you do after that? The only other place is turn around, go back to God. So when we get to places, because I get doing this, doing any of this work, when you're helping people and you're doing things that are considered revolutionary, you go take a blunt force. And sometimes what I realize is that you have to diagnose your own issues as well. Because part of what makes you great is your problems, right? This addiction to helping people, right? Because you got to be the hero in the narrative in people's stories. How can I help you? How can I help you? And that's the way you learn to love. Right. And so it's always giving, always helping people instead of sitting back and learning that I don't have to help you to be loved. Right. That becomes the love language of warriors is helping and being the savior at all times. And so sometimes, though, you get to that point where it's like it's the thing you want to do and it's what God wants you to do. And if you're not doing the thing that God wants you to do, it's not going to work. So you're going to get to that point that it's always going to be a brick wall because you've already done what you've said, everything you can say. You've done what you can do in this space. You've done the work. Now, what's the graduation? Because the one thing I get from Pac is like when he was like, you know, yeah, thug life is, is like a high school diploma. I was a thug. They can't never take it away. But you don't stay in high school. You graduate. Right. It doesn't mean that you don't no longer have your diploma, your high school degree and your experiences. But now I move forward. I'm going to always have my diploma. I'm going to always be a part of the thug life. But we graduate. So where's the graduation for the revolutionaries, for the activists? That goes into the way you do things. It goes into what you do. It goes into how you do them. It goes into even into why you do them. Right? It has to look into this age. What is the best way to do it? There are some things that work well. Keep doing those things. But what are things that you can do better? And when you start asking your question what I can do better, a lot of times you don't want to do that because that's the uncomfortable thing, right? So we often demonize the way we see other people doing things because it's like, well, traditionally, this worked for me. I don't know about that shit you're doing over there. It might be working, but I still don't know. I listen a lot, and I just listen to language, and it's like, 
we can recognize something work and still not want to do it because that's not the way we work. Yeah. Right. But that's the way God works. So we have to get to a point where the revolution has to be spirited based on no, no, back into that godly intelligence. We have to move based on the best way that, yeah, we got to do the research, but it has to be execution because we have seen things funded just for research, 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 right? But there was no development, right? And then we had to get to a point where everybody has to be used for whatever. If your ego is you want to be out there in front of the TV, we're going to put you in front of the TV, but you better make sure you speak our agenda. Right. If your movement is supposed to be centered around the people, then you have to be transparent. And we have to understand beyond what your grief is, beyond what your beef is with another person. We don't care if it's for the people. It don't matter your feelings in the first place. So you can't spearhead your movement based on your personal grievances. Right. Not if it's supposed to be for the people, because at that point, it's no longer for the people. It's to satisfy you and your desires in the way you want to customize it in the best way you feel like you can get things out of it. So we at this point in time where we know we don't have no excuses. All we have to do is share information. We have to create this constitution and we have to fund it ourselves because if we don't fund it, I don't even think nobody else should fund it, right? If we don't begin, if you don't put the money in the pot first, how you gonna ask somebody else to start it off? The most beautiful thing I heard about Harry Belafonte, him being the first person to have a platinum, you know, album, but he said he funded the civil rights movement. Right. That's being for the people, putting your money where your mind is. Everything we do have been independent. We funded it ourselves. We go on tour. We fund it. We do high level conversations. We fund it because I already know nobody else is going to do that. But when you fund it, you have a proven model. And when that proven model, now you can figure out how to get the interests of other people that want to be involved to help fund it as well. Regardless, their interests don't have to be yours. It has to be for the strategy to get to the overall desire which is to win this war so that we won't have to continue to fight the same war over and over and over. Listen, I'm 19 Keys. Make sure y'all continue to support organizations, right, such as Life Camp, brothers such as Jay Jordan and everything that he's doing and everybody who's fighting this movement. But to me, one of the most important things is check up on them. Who gonna say the heroes, right? Everybody that's out there doing the work, you know, it's, it's not just their job. Right. It's the people's job to make sure that the worst get done. It's the people's job to make sure that they continue to develop to be even greater warriors. Right. It's the people's job that working in those corporate positions that work and control the funding. It's, it's it's everybody's job to help society get better. So the people that has made it their specific job to work on aspects of society for the betterment, everybody's going to benefit if they do their job well. So that means that it wasn't just the Black Panther's job to be out there in front of the police. And then when the tactics were made against them, they started doing drugs and all sort of issues happened. What was the people that helped them? What was the people that made sure that they could still eat? Because they couldn't go get a job after they put themselves on the front line, right? So you want front line soldiers, but you don't want to help them on the back end. To me, that makes no sense. And to me, nobody owes the people that if the people don't owe them as well. It's a two way streak. You can't say you love your revolutionaries if you don't actually have a duty towards them like they have towards you. So. These are people that put their life before the movement, right? And now they got to put more movement in their life. I'm 19 Keys. Make sure y'all tap into the next high level conversation with more solutions. Peace. I'm 19 Keys, and this is high level conversation. Tap in with the guys. Being here, so at, at first, I knew Jay Jordan because he was Carmen's husband, right? And you talk about like how people call you time done, right? I call you Carmen's husband, right? And so getting to talk to Jay and learning about Jay and, you know, and, and meeting him, I, I, I love him, right? And so going against allowing yourself to be present for what is, is very important and the fact that that I did that um, it allowed me to meet a brother who's going to be part of my future you know and to to be part of high level conversation with 19 keys is just allows me to to show the importance of the the, the message right um, I look at 19 keys right now as a stamp for a lot of what people need to listen to, what people need to, to connect themselves to, and how people need to show up, 
right? And so to sit here with both of them, it's just, it's further inspiration and, and light that that my next journey, my next steps, is, is divine order. So sharing the stage with the Erica Ford, like the, gotta put the the in front of her name, put some respect on her name, nah. Um, nah, she's an icon. Like, I don't look up to a lot of people. Um, if like you, if you know me, then you know like I'm a nerd at heart, right? You know what I mean? I, I go deep on issues. I'm I'm a researcher at heart. You know what I mean? If I didn't go to prison, I'd probably be a Harvard researcher. You some somewhere. I still might be. You know what I mean? But like I look up to people who make change and deep, impactful change, right? Like I am a student of the movement. I'm a student of impact, social impact. Um, and there's several people in America that have made impact, um, but there's few people that have made impact and are still alive, right? And so whenever I get a chance to sit under, to sit around, to be next to people who are making impact, I don't take that for granted. For me, it's like being next to Jay-Z, you know what I mean? And people may be like, oh, no, it's not. Like, yeah, it is, though, you know what I mean? Because the impact that she has made reverberates not only through her community, but through the entire country. You know, when she talks about going to the White House and lobbying for billions of dollars to go to save lives and take guns out of kids' hands, that, for me, is better than winning the Super Bowl. You know what I mean? Like, that's... That's that's heroic. That's God's work. And so to sit next to somebody who has got the gall, you know what I mean? The intestinal fortitude to be like, give us billions of dollars so we can save our babies. And then not only plan it, but execute it. Um, not only um, build a company to save lives, but build a brand and bring people in. Like You don't get that every day. You don't get that every day. You show me another person that rides around in orange trucks and orange vans saving lives. You know what I mean? That's like that's like one of a kind in the country. <clears throat> and that's not like a not a joke. It's true. She's the only, it's like she's one of one. I know a lot of violence interrupters that are, you know, copycats or carbon copies of what they learned. You know, Erica Ford has done it by herself, has has built this brand, has brought people in, you know, has built coalitions and have actually saved lives. And so to be you know, on the stage with her um, is awe-inspiring. And, you know what I mean? This is something that I'm going to cherish for the rest of my life. And, you know, my kid's going to be like, I remember when, you know what I mean? So, yeah, man, this is this, this is dope. And in terms of, like, so there's two more things. In terms of, like, being in his office, I had the opportunity of meeting Mr. B a few times. And when I walked into his house the first time, I didn't really know anything about him, just my wife had worked for him. I knew, you know, who he was. I did my research, so I knew what I was walking into, but I didn't know what I was walking into. This man's house, right? And I looked on the wall, and the first thing I saw was a handwritten version of, I have, I've been to the mountaintop. And I'm like, whoa, okay, I'm in, I'm in, I'm in a different vibration here. And um, to see that not only did he work in entertainment and arts and culture and the civil rights movement and the human rights movement and the anti-apartheid movement and the anti-imperialism movement. But he also, in his later um, uh, years in life, in his golden years, had the where thought to say, now I'm going to go back and help people in prison and build a movement to end childhood incarceration. Like, who does that? Like, who does that, right? Like, he could have easily took his millions and lived his life and would have been great. He had a nice house, you know what I mean? It would have been great, but he he didn't do that. He didn't sit down and say, I'm done. He actually like worked until he couldn't work anymore and poured into Carmen and poured into the gathering and poured into everybody that was around him, you know, from Diddy to Erica to everybody, you know what I mean? Like he would call people up here and, and pour into them. So to be up here, you know, with Erica Ford talking about, um, you know, how to move forward in this movement is great. And the last thing I would say is, you know, um, I am into long form podcasts. <laughs> That's my guilty pleasure. Like I will watch a two, three hour podcast. You know what I mean? Um, and so when I seen Key starting his, I was like, oh shit, this is going to be dope. Because the other long form podcast out there is like Joe Rogan. Right. And, and he has some, like very deep conversations. 
um, with some folks. Um, but to have deep conversations and have high level conversations, that's a whole lot of space in between them. You dig what I'm saying? No dig on Joe Rogan and what and what he got going on. You know, I, I, I think long form podcasts give folks an opportunity to really get their thoughts out. And in the age of 30 second bites, I mean, now it's like 10 second bites, right? Um, three second bites. If your shit ain't popping in three seconds, people going to swipe. Um, to give a person an opportunity to like actually get a full thought out um, is, is what we need. I mean, thinking back to, um, you know, um, when William Buckley um, uh, 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 debated uh, James Baldwin, you know, at Cambridge, right? Like I watched that over and over and over and over and over. And it gives me so much um, just a uh, 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 pride in how James Baldwin dismantled his ass. You know what I mean? Nikki Giovanni told James Baldwin, no, nigga, lie to me. <laughs> like you lie to the white folks. <laughs> lie to me. I need that. Right? Like long form podcast gives you an opportunity to have those in-depth conversations because the world is complex and it's nuanced and you cannot just sit there and have a 30 second conversation, a 30 minute conversation and break these things down. Um, I could have sat here and talked all day, you know, and we could have went to different levels and like went deep on everything and went high on, on other things. I think this is what's needed. Um, and the last thing I'll say about this is just seeing how short form content shifts brain um, um, and neural pathways. Um, that's what is going to be something that that's something that we have to watch for in the next four to five years is how people interact with each other in the world based on their inability to watch long form podcasts or long form content. You know, people aren't even sitting through 30 minute um, 30 minute shows anymore. Right. Like viewership is going down on the news. People are like, literally, I want it and I want it now and it better be good. And so to have a person that's out there saying, no, we're going to I'm gonna build a platform where people can come and hear, you know, intelligent conversations is something that um, those who came before him have done. And hopefully he starts to trend to ensure that people come after him, stick to the long form content, because that's what expands our collective consciousness. For me, I think this conversation, number one, I think it's for everybody. It's something that often we probably don't want to talk about a lot of times because it puts our mind on a problem, right? A problem that it frustrates us, right? It, it gives us anxiety to even think about, right? All of the issues that you can't solve. <laughs> because it's not something you can go immediately do something and you as an individual just changes the system, right? It's something that requires patience. It's something that requires unity. And it's something that also requires a passion and a fundamental understanding of. But it's something that we have to be consistently aware of, right? When you allow people to forget, then they can ignore, right? When, when, when people are ignorant of, then they can be taken advantage of, right? So when we see what's happening all throughout America today, even with the issue that's going on in Florida right now with DeSantis, not wanting to teach people proper and true history of America, right, then that leaves you doomed to repeat the same mistakes. You want the next generation ignorant so they can be taken advantage of and they can mold America without the truth, right? So for here, it's like, no, nah, everybody has to sit down with your family and learn about what's really going on in America so you can be conscientious so that it has an effect on your decision making regardless of what position you in. You might be somebody in a corporate position and was like, damn, I wasn't even thinking about that. Like, these are things that I get the privilege of not having to acknowledge, right? You may be somebody that has a brother in the streets and you ain't even think about the fact that, damn, maybe I could apply one of those tactics like, you know, Erica Ford said, and maybe take him out this situation for a second and then get him to think about his decision, right? I, I see so many people that just crash out because not only do we, we, we're not empathetic when we don't think about the future, right? When we don't think about the future, we're not empathetic. There's been tests and studies to where they tell people to think about the past and they tell people to think about the future. And it changes their perspective in relation towards the way they go about doing things. Because when you think about the future, you're not just thinking about self. You're thinking about everybody that's in the future as well, right? What is the future of black America? What's the future of the black man? The future of the black woman? What's the future of society? It automatically has you thinking about how everybody's gonna be impacted by these shifts and changes. So whatever ideas you have for the future is already an empathetic one because it's gonna affect everybody, especially if you're creating something in a positive manner, right? So as we talk about what's happening in the present, we talked about the past, 
but it was important for us to think about the future because we are the ones that have to plan it. We are the ones that have the impact for it. We are the ones that have to uh, create the simulations for it and think about everything that we've done and be like, yo, we've put in so much energy in this and it hasn't yielded the results that we wanted, right? So what's a better way to do it to where we can get a greater impact with less amount of energy, right? We can get greater impact with even less funds because there's always a better way, right? So we can't even get stuck in tradition. We can't get stuck in the norms. We all have to learn from each other, communicate with each other to figure out how do we make this thing change that may require, let's say, 50 years of work, but how do we get it done in 10, right? Sometimes there's more people, sometimes there's more money, sometimes there's better ideas, right? So for me, this episode is about thinking about things that we normally have the privilege of ignoring. So therefore, regardless of what position you're in, you can do something about it. In terms of the work that we did, like when Nelson Mandela came to the New York City, we did flyers door to door in every project in yeah. New York City. Yeah. Right? We used to have to paint and like we get the subways at five in the morning. going to jump into crown society you're saying that i represent power i represent knowledge of self stepping in the name of drip get ready with me stepping in the name of drip get ready i wear the crown to just symbolize like i know who i am i know why i'm here i know my purpose it's abundance it's royalty it's prosperity it's energy it's put in yeah i gotta walk with my head held high because you gotta see this and you gotta see this i believe that if anybody wants to be able to protect their mind and be able to think freely you gotta get Crown Society today, man. Neo after the blue pill, the color palette's all black. James Bond mix with Malcolm X and my Che Guevara era.